지구상에는 몇 개의 언어가 존재할까요? 현존하는 세계의 토착 언어는 7천여 개. 하지만 이중 3분의 1이 넘는 2,600여 개의 토착 언어는 사라질 위기에 처해 있습니다. 우리 인류의 소중한 문화유산인 토착 언어 가운데 그 언어의 사용자가 줄어들고 다음 세대까지 온전하게 보전되지 못하면서 사라져가는 언어들이 늘어나고 있는 것인데요. 이렇게 사라져가는 토착 언어를 보전하는 일은 그 속에 담긴 지식과 경험, 역사를 보전하는 동시에 전세계 언어와 문화의 다양성을 지켜내는 일이기도 합니다. 분단 이후 최초로 남과 북이 공동으로 편찬하고 있는 결의 말 근사전은 지난 2019년부터 유엔이 지정한 세계 토착어의 해에 동참하는 동시에 지금의 언어를 수집, 기록해 나가는 사전 편찬 작업의 의미를 많은 세계 시민들과 공유하고자 이번 국제학술 포럼을 준비하게 되었습니다. 2018년 10월 문재인 대통령과 오드레 아줄레 유네스코 사무총장의 접견을 통해 토착 언어와 결의말 근사전 남북 공동 편찬 사업에 대한 관심 요청을 계기로 국제학술 포럼이 시작되게 되었습니다. 유네스코 결의말 근사전 국제학술 포럼에서는 세계 토착 언어는 어떤 모습으로 기록되고 있는지 모두가 함께 지속가능한 사회를 만들기 위해 토착 언어의 필요성에 대한 논의와 분단이라는 특수한 상황에서 통일이라는 과제를 앞둔 또는 이뤄낸 여러 국가의 사례를 통해 분단된 언어의 통합 문제 그리고 그 과정에서 사전의 역할과 결의말 근사전 편찬 사업의 의미를 살펴보는 소중한 시간이 될 것입니다. 인류의 소중한 유산, 토착 언어의 지속가능한 발전 유네스코 결의말 근사전 국제학술 포럼에 여러분을 초대합니다. 네, 지금부터 유네스코 결의말 Now we will open the second session of the International Academic Forum, Sustainable Development of Indigenous Languages. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Anheji, currently a researcher of compilation department at the Kyoremal k u n s a j o n and I will be the moderator of the second day. The International Academic Forum for the Sustainable Development of Indigenous Languages is joined in by online participants from home and abroad. As the moderator of the second day, I once again extend a sincere gratitude and welcome to all of you here. Before we begin the session, I'd like to provide you with the information on the translation services. You will have translation service receivers on your table. Channel 1 is Korean, Channel 2 is English, and Channel 3 is French. So you may set the receiver to the language that you need. For online participants, you may also listen to your preferred language on the YouTube channel. And now, the International Academic Forum will begin its second day schedule. Let us begin the second session under the theme Collection and Dec Documentation of Indigenous Languages. Before we begin, Secretary General of the k y o r e m a l k u n s a j o n Ms. Mo Soon Young, will deliver the briefing from day one. I'd like to deliver the briefing from day one. The International Academic Forum is being held during the two days of yesterday and today with the aim of sharing the anthropological meaning of preserving and recording indigenous and minority languages and actively participate in the UN's International Decade of Indigenous Languages and to seek the development of international networks and mutual academic cooperation. It's also expected to encourage greater support and empathy for the compilation of the k y o r e m a l k u n s a j o n Dictionary of the two Koreas from the international community. The International Academic Forum is sponsored by the Ministries of Unification and Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, supported by UNESCO, and is joined by scholars from Korea, France, Germany, Iran, Norway, Canada, 
and Gambia, as well as officials from the board for the compilation of the Kyoremalkan Sazon and UNESCO. In the first session, we discussed the theme of preservation of indigenous languages and the discussion was truly heated. And now, before we begin the next session, I'd like to deliver the briefing from day one, which followed the opening ceremony, to create a liaison with the following session. First, at the opening ceremony, President Yeom Moom of the Board of Kyoremal Kansajan emphasized the meaning of this International Academic Forum with UNESCO and reminded it us of the late Reverend Muni Kwan, who first agreed to compile a South-North Unified Dictionary, which became the starting point of the compilation project. He also mentioned that the endangerment of indigenous languages and cultures is a warning of the end of mankind and therefore must be stopped at all costs. And during his welcoming speech, Secretary General Han Gyeonggu of the Korean National Commission for UNESCO said that understanding of each other's language is important in that it is a stepping stone for laying peace between South and North Korea. And it is worthy to note the compilation of the Kyoremal Kun Sajon in that it's a project of pre preparing the groundwork to set up a wall of peace in our minds through language and that it is also what makes us look forward to this International Academic Forum. Particularly, Minister of Unification Yi in Young, in his congratulatory speech video, reminded us that the compilation of the Kyoremal Kun Sajon itself has been an experience of a small unification. Minister Lee, in his video, also stress the South Korean government's commitment to implement the peace process on the Korean Peninsula so that the many agreements made by the two leaders of South and North Koreas are implemented within this year so as to create a solid state of peace. And he also shared his hope that the 26th meeting of the Joint Board of South and North Korea for the compilation of the Kyoremal Kun Sajan to be resumed in the near future. Ambassador of the permanent Delegation of the ROK to UNESCO Kim Dong-gi stated that preservation of indigenous languages and linguistic diversity will bring us reconciliation, respect, and tolerance for others. And through this, we will be able to preserve peace and realize gender equality, thereby contributing in many ways, many other ways than language communication. He also stressed the meaning of the Joint Board of South and North Korea for the compilation of Jeoremal Kun Sajon in that it is a joint effort of South and North Korea and the effort to preserve indigenous languages. He also shared his hope for us to preserve linguistic diversity and multilingualism. And in the following first session, uh, former professor at Korea University Kang Chung-yong was the moderator and the president of the Sami parliament and the co-chair of the steering committee of the IYIL 2019, Ms. Ailik Hasketalo, in her keynote lecture titled Placing Indigenous Languages on the Global Agenda Within the Context of the International Year of Indigenous Languages, said that today we are trying to get back to our languages to maintain the language spectrum. Even though the road is, has been long and winding, we are not giving up. We're trying to revitalize our languages and flourish our cultures. But to succeed, we need the support and protection from authorities and decision makers. Also, she gave us the example of the nine Sami languages that are left and that there are more than nine language situations. And she also shared her hope that UN and UNESCO becomes an arena for indigenous people to get together and join efforts to seek solutions together. Ms. Mandana Saipedijipu, Director of Endangered Languages Documentation Program at University of London, delivered a presentation titled Building Sustainable Societies, A Role of Language, Importance of Preservation, Documentation and Promotion. She explained the joint efforts with UNESCO on the World Language Report, online archives and preservations, and also shared an overview of the current status of languages of today. She talked about indigenous, minority, and marginalized languages, and that marginalized languages especially hold a strong political implication. She also shared graphs on the global breakdown of users of languages and the locations of the languages throughout the world. She also shared suggestions for documenting and preserving minority language materials. 
Mr. Yakut Twa, Chief at the Universal Access to Information Section at the Communication Information Sector at UNESCO, made a presentation on promoting linguistic diversity and multilingualism at the UNESCO World Atlas of Languages. He presented on the importance of linguistic diversity and multilingualism and the effort to promote them. He also explained the background of the International Year of Indigenous Languages 2019 and the International Decade of Indigenous Languages 2022 to 2023 which are meaningful in that they set a historic platform with a clear and long-term goal for common action to promote global language diversity. He also introduced the upcoming publication of the World Atlas of Languages and the World Language Report 2021. Mr. Angni Boye, Professor Emeritus at the Paul Valery University of Montpellier III, made a presentation titled Global Politics of Occitan Yesterday and Today, and focused on the relationship between language and identity, and presented on the linguistic policies of France regarding the Occitan language. He first introduced preliminary considerations, the status of the Occitan, language policies favorable to the Occitan, and the global political microactions that counter language substitution. As an example, he introduced the names of wine cuvées by showing the images of the various wines with Occitan labels, which was especially interesting for the participants. As the last presenter of the first session, Professor Conjel of Seoul National University delivered his presentation titled Fieldwork on Endangered Altaic Languages in China, Russia, Mongolia, and Central Asia, and introduced a field study in Korea concerning endangered languages. Particularly through his detailed and orderly explanation of the field study on the Altaic language and the documentation process, it seems that his presentation will be a valuable reference to those who will conduct future studies in the future, as well as providing useful information to the audience as well. In the following general discussion moderated by Professor uh, Yeon Jae-hoon of SOAS University of London, the discussion has been truly heated and it was joined by online and offline participants, former Professor Kang chung Yong of Korea University, Vice President Chung Do-sang of the Kyore Malkun Seo-jeon, Professor Kwon yuk of Korea University, and Professor Chung Eun jin of Korea University, as well as the com comments and questions at our YouTube streaming. And it was a time to share the meaning and empathy. We, and uh, there were also a question on the Occitan language and the preservation of uh, minority languages. And uh, in order to, and during this discussion, Chief Yako Duto emphasized the importance of education for broader transmission of the native language. Also, after, uh, during the discussion, Vice President Jung Do Sang made a briefing on the 2021 literary activities in indigenous languages. And Chief Yako Du Toa complimented the project by sharing his wish to have documents and uh, digitalization in indigenous languages. He also mentioned it is important to select the more valuable languages among the endangered languages and revitalize them. He also said that and also, he continued by stating that the Joint Board of South and North Korea for the compilation of the Kyoremal Kunsajan laid uh, the platform to be utilized by all, and through this platform, we may be able to promote and revitalize indigenous languages, thereby reminding us of the meaning of the project once again. And uh, so, from overseas, it was from 9 a.m. to 1, and in Korea to 5 p.m., from 5 p.m. to uh, 9 p.m. I'd like to thank all of you who attended the previous day, and I ask for your active participation today as well. With that, I'd like to conclude the briefing from day one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, Secretary General Mo Soon Young. Thank you. We'll now commence the second session of the International Academic Forum, Sustainable Development of Indigenous Language. The topic of the session is the collections and documentation of indigenous language. During the presentation, if you have any questions or comments, just like yesterday, please write them down on the live trading room. Please take active participation. So, before we officially kick off the second session, a keynote lecture will be given by Director Hong Jong Sun of the Compilation Committee. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. 
I am Director Hong Jong-sun of the Confederation Committee member. I'll begin the keynote lecture on the minority language and how to narrow the linguistic gap in divided nation. Based on the accelerating pace of extinctions of the minority languages in the late 20th century, linguists are concerned that more than half of the 6,000 to 7,000 languages that exist today will disappear by the end of the 21st century unless concerted measures are implemented toward their preservation. <laughs> and the consensus that extinction of languages represent an enormous cultural loss for humanity, research institute and researchers in many countries, including UNESCO, are striving to preserve or document the endangered languages as much as possible. Such an endeavor remains invaluable. However, there should be as much concern for an interest in minority languages or divided languages as extinct ones. All of these divided languages share common features of their native speakers being divided and lacking in mutual exchanges and in sufficient social exchanges and communication. Some of these are also very prone to extinction. Especially, some of these languages have a greater risk of being extinct. Languages on the verge of extinction, but still used by some native speakers, can be called as minority languages. If speakers of a minority languages are concentrated in a certain regions, then that language might be reviewed or regarded as facing a less serious threat of extinction than an endangered languages. So we need to discuss together. In addition to these cases, I will also discuss the case of majority languages becoming minority ones due to the migration and division of linguistic communities. The former can be called as a local minority language, and the later one can be called as regionally dispersed minority language. The social problems posed by the minority languages of dispersed people used to pertain much more to highly developed countries, but more countries now witness similar problems as overseas. Migration has increased in recent years. In large countries with big populations such as the United States, China, Russia, India, and Australia, Native languages or foreign languages of a small number of immigrants become minority languages in that country. The smaller countries keep experiencing similar problems between immigrants and local residents as the immigrant population grow. The birth and extinction of a language is a common phenomenon in the history of humanity, but in today's capitalist and socialist societies, language tends to serve short-term commercial interest or social gains, thus participating shrink and extinctions of minority languages. This problem or problematic features is mostly ascribed to the capitalist logic of economy. However, language plays a large role in constituting the identity of individual speakers and contributes to the community as a culture 
of the speakers. Only when the century pedal point of society members is effectively conjoined by the centrifugal force of them, can society arrive at both social development and personal achievement. Given that language underlies this issue, society needs a social system and policies that address the issue mindfully. Second, preservation of minority language. Minority languages fall into two main categories. First, the speakers are concentrated in a given locality, and second, the speakers are dispersed throughout many localities as minorities. Both of these need appropriate language policies and actual status of the minority languages or method to preserve them may vary depending on the category. Minority languages spoken by a small number of people in a relatively small area may be at the greatest risk of imminent extinctions, thus necessitating the most urgent attention and affirmative language policy. Linguists currently estimate the words extant languages at roughly 6,000 to 7,000, but a closer investigation may reveal greater number. For example, in Indonesia, about 350 ethnic groups are estimated to speak more than 726 languages. Most minority language speakers and their societies, confined to certain local areas, lack the ability to preserve their languages on their own. Personal economic issues or the state logic of efficiency often keeps societies from upholding the just cause to preserve minority languages. Individuals of that society have no choice but to abandon their own languages and accept the more powerful majority language in order to advance to a larger and higher society while the state and society support or encourage them to do so. Minority language speakers and society lack self-reliance and viability compared to majority language speakers because of the unfavorable disparity in economic wealth cultural competencies, and population who use that language size. Therefore, primary support from the state and society is absolutely needed to preserve these local minority languages. Further, a global support system is required to preserve them. Currently, UNESCO is keenly interested in endangered languages and working on a project to preserve them, but it is ma its measures to that end remains too passive. The project of investigating and documenting endangered languages can hardly slow down the pace of extinctions of the endangered and minority languages. Today, the capitalist logic of survival that has encroached upon the linguistic realm is becoming more prevalent and more alarming, which means that international institutions must intervene more actively so as to safeguard the future of minority languages. UNESCO and cultured intellectuals should be actively engaged in the activities to preserve endangered languages so that people around the world fully appreciate their values. To achieve meaningful outcomes, 
Each country must implement a wide range of effective policies to preserve minority languages and ensure that each member of society understand the proposal of policies. Languages are more likely to survive if they have transcription system. Minority languages that do not have letters must find a transcription system suitable for their verbal words with an external aid. So support from the outside is necessary. One example in Indonesia is the language called Jia spoken by more than 80,000 people in Indonesia who opted for the Hangul transcription system in the absence of its own letters. Research and economic assistance are needed to ensure that minority languages have their own alphabet. Of course, the speakers who use the minority language should have a pride in developing their own languages and acquiring bilingual skills in engaging in exchanges with speakers of majority language. They should be ready to contribute to society in a diverse and inclusive way rather than being exclusively self-protective. Minority language speakers in a country are also experiencing difficulties. They still have some difficulties. They use minority languages as indigenous and native people in some cases and purpose of policies. When the population reaches a considerable size, their languages are nominally recognized by the state, but in practice their speakers suffer considerable difficulties in exercising their rights. Moreover, various restrictions are implicitly imposed on them in most countries. The policies to protect minority ethnic groups have also been implemented and intellectuals should engage in an international effort to help policymakers and the general public recognize that the speakers of minority language do not dissipate the national power but contribute to society in a variety of cultural ways. Minorities should be given institutional and practical care so that they may lead social lives without significant disadvantages. Concordia Language Village, which have been operating since 1961 in Minnesota, United States, are a very meaningful exemplary project as an endeavor to preserve the 15 minority languages that coexist with English in the United States. In addition, I propose a new creative method to be adopted as a policy on local minority language. This is quite radical, but the proposal is to increase the probability of survival of minority or critically endangered language by integrating them with other neighboring endangered languages to create larger language group. Then, once again, it can exist. As most of the integrated language, we can definitely integrate again. As most the local minority and endangered languages are cognate with neighboring ones but remain separate languages due to the absence of exchange between communities for a long time. Many of them seem to stand a higher chance of integration through a common provenance. Therefore, integration is definitely feasible. It would be easy to integrate them if they have synthetic structure not differing much from each other except for slight differences in their vocabulary, morphology, and semant semantics. In any case, sufficient linguistic research or social consideration should precede the project 
of integration. I'll give an example. In the northern part of India, the language of Bahar, Tulu, all of these languages can be an example. And in Sudan, Swahili, Pingor, these are the languages or 2 to 3 or 78 languages can be integrated. And third, how to narrow the linguistic gap in divided nations. There were some cases of division within a single language group due to historical twists and turns. Korea, divided into the north and south, is a representative one, as is China, divided into two polities, mainland China and Taiwan. Unified Germany has still been contending with the aftermath of its division into the east and west for decades. Besides these, there are several large and small divided areas on the planet. And the longer the division persists, the wider the gap becomes with respect to language. Immediately after its liberation from Japanese colonial rule in 1945, China, Korea was divided into the South and North and remains so without inter-Korean social exchanges still to this day for about three-fourths about three of a century. Because of this division, North and South Korean languages came to have different words and experiences. Originally, the South and North had different dialects even before the liberation, but after being divided into two Koreas, the linguistic gap was widened due to different social systems and different ideologies. Mindful of this issue, the two Koreas agreed in 2005 to reduce the language difference between the two Koreas and prevent further divergence in the future and to create a unified Korean dictionary that encompasses both North and South Korean words. They agreed to name the dictionary, which is the unabridged and unified Korean dictionary, and to enlist the South and North Korean words equally as well as Korean words used abroad. Accordingly, the dictionary will compile the standard language of the South, the Munha, that is the standard dialect of the North, regional dialects, and written languages also, they agreed to conduct research on the old Korean dialects spoken in the three northeastern provinces of China, mainly in Yeonben, where many ethnic Koreans live, and the far Rus Russian Far East and Central Asia, as well as in Japan, to compile the vocabularies of the old Korean and explanations of their meanings and usages in dictionary. This is a project to list the official Korean, old Korean, northern Korean dialects spoken all over the world in one dictionary to conduct by conducting a research on the minority Korean languages to preserve them and facilitate communication among disturbed Korea people. China and Taiwan also agreed in 1995 on a plan to produce a cross-strait dictionary. So immediately after the agreement, the Beijing Language and Cultural University and the Taipei Language Institute came together to create the dictionary from, 2000, uh, from 1996 to 2003 and published it in mainland China in 2003 and in Taiwan in 2006. The modern Chinese cross street dictionary contains 46,000 words, including about 1,300 words used only in the mainland and about 1,000 words used only in Taiwan. Aimed at cross-strait exchanges and assisting foreigners with Chinese language acquisition, this dictionary neither sets a norm nor integrates the two languages, but rather represents both languages exactly as they currently are. It is thus characterized as being descriptive, communicative, and practical.
It was designed to focus specifically on communication among Chinese and Taiwanese without attempting to hastily integrate in the acknowledgement of the reality of the linguistic gap, and this is a characteristic that resembles the Kyorema Kunsajan Dictionary. Additionally, China has pursued the integration of technical terms in each specialized field for more than 20 years since it collaborated with Taiwan on a cross-trade dictionary of technical terms in 1993. And after the, east, after the division in East and West Germany, there formed a wide gap between the two German languages, mainly in terms of vocabulary. Particularly, there was a large difference in the use of official language. However, during the 34-year period after reunification, East Germany accepted about two to 3,000 West German words and abandoned a large number of East German words. The East-West German scholars and governments actively implemented policies to grapple with the differences of the two and successfully bridged the gap. Compilation of an integrated dictionary that encompasses both languages in a divided region and its distribution are deemed significantly meaningful, not only because it can provide a basis for unification, but also because it creates an atmosphere conducive to unification by facilitating communication between the two divided regions. However, a more dynamic policy must accompany the project to expand language exchange and communication. The governments from both sides should provide systematic support to institutionalize such exchange. If such political level or government level exchange cannot be realized, a lower level exchange, that is, the exchange by non-governmental organizations joined by scholars, educators, journalists, and leaders of social sectors should be established to conduct extensive exchanges and research at the civic level to facilitate the exchanges of the general public. And it is crucial to expand the non-governmental exchange among the general public. Non-political linguistic exchanges are all the more required if the divided communities are locked in a political confrontation or have different social systems. In the early meetings for the compilation of the Kyoremal Kunsajan Dictionary, there was a nervous tension among the researchers from the South and the North. But the tense atmosphere has gradually eased over the 10 years and now turned into that of understanding and compromise for the completion of their task. As the meetings continued, mutual understanding and amicable atmospheres set in, thus facilitating exchange and conversation. Divided communities over the world should strive for integration. However, if integration cannot be achieved in a short period of time, then it is necessary to narrow the gap with language exchanges in during the time being. In order to overcome such division, members of the divided community must make more enthusiastic efforts than anyone else. But neighboring countries should also pursue regional peace and development and international organizations such as the United Nations and UNESCO should actively support it as well. And through such efforts, this effort should, to overcome the division anywhere in the world will lead to world peace. And the starting point of this endeavor is to try to make the diglossia ameliorated for social exchanges. Fourth conclusion, minority languages used by few speakers often go extinct. 
Therefore, international attention, research, and positive measures are required for their preservation. Today, the languages of local minorities are rapidly shrinking, so more active support is needed to preserve them. Protection of the minority languages at the national level is required, first of all, in addition to the provision of characters to transcribe them. It may be desirable to consider a measure to create a larger language group by integrating local minority languages neighboring each other. As for the minority languages spoken by dispersed people, local governments should support the activities to preserve them, and the international society should make efforts to encourage public understanding of the contribution of minority languages to the community. However, the most crucial are the efforts of minority language speakers themselves to preserve their own languages. In the divided language community, there have been efforts to overcome the linguistic gap and compile dictionaries for communication between the two sides. But the local governments need to implement policies more actively to narrow the linguistic gap. To this end, neighboring countries and international bodies should pay keen attention to and support their efforts at the humanitarian level. The compilation of the Kyoremal Kansajan Dictionary in Korea and the Cross Trade Dictionary in China are important projects to facilitate communication of the divided people that should be backed by policies to utilize the dictionaries widely in both sides of the divided countries. All of these efforts would combine to open an avenue to peace and progress of humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Hong jong san you have uh, urged for the attention on the endangered and minority languages and also stress the importance of such uh, dictionary compilation, uh, integrated dictionary compilations. Uh, this has opened the door to our second session, which is uh, on collection and documentation of indigenous languages. And I'll introduce the next speaker. Uh, Professor Yu Yeon Gyeong uh, from Yonsei University and also a compilation committee member at the Kyoremal Kunsajan. And the title is Unified Dictionary of the Korean Language in South and North Korea. Kyoremal Kunsajan. Good morning and also good afternoon, good evening. I'm very pleased to meet all of you. This is a remarkable time where people from France and other countries and from Korea, we are all meeting here. Let me introduce myself. I'm Professor Yu Hyun Gyeong of Yonsei University. I'm a compilation committee member. First of all, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude for having this chance to make a presentation at such an important international academic forum. The title of my presentation is Unified Dictionary of the Korean Language in South and North Korea. As you haven't seen, my written paper. It's quite lengthy, and only a limited time is given to me, so I'll not be reading the whole paper. Uh, the area that I'm omitting or deleting, please refer to my paper later on. Keremai Kunsajon, as it is known, began to be discussed in 1989 when the late Reverend Moon Ikwan visited North Korea and suggested to North Korean Premier Kim Il sung that to Korea write a unified Korean language dictionary to which Kim agreed. After that, there was little progress in the project, but in March 2005, with a ceremony to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the death of the Reverend Moon, the project was revived and South and North Korea signed the statement of intent to compile a unified Korean language dictionary in Longjin, China. The name Kyore Mai Kun began to be used officially. In December of the same year, members of the South and North Korean committee set up for the compilation of Kyore Mai Kun Exchange Compilation Agreement at Kumgang. In February 2005, South and North Korean officials gathered at Mount in Kumgang to launch the actual compilation efforts and adopted a joint report. Thereafter, the project began in earnest, and in August 2005, the second joint committee of South and North Korea for the compilation of Kyoremal Kunsajon agreed to joint 
compilation guideline, which forms the broad principle for the compilation. Hong predicted that the Korean American Sajon project would take about seven years to complete from January 2005 to December 2011. However, forming agreement on the content and guideline for compilation of the dictionary is a laborious task requiring a triple or quadruple the time and energy than for other dictionaries. So, triple and quadruple time was spent. A total of 25 joint meetings involving the two Koreas took place up until 2015, but the work has continued without a joint meeting for the past six years as of 2020. The number of had words that South and North Korea agreed to register in Korean Kunsa Jeon is total of 330,000 with 307,000 on the verge of completion. The project is still waiting 23,000 new words from North Korea. At this point, it is necessary to look at the overhaul status of Korean American Sajon, which will be released into the international community after 15 years of work. I'd like to examine the characteristic and significance of the Korean American Sajon as unified dictionary for South and North Korea. I'll skip chapter 2, going into chapter 3, Korean American Sajon as a language integration dictionary. The dictionary is integrating the South and North Korean language and existence of Korean as manifested by the dictionary has gradually been revealed. I'd like to look at the characteristic of the dictionary as language integration, the macrostructure and microstructure. The number of the headwords in the dictionary is now 300,000, 7,000 is the composition of so these headwords that characterize Korean American Sajon as a language integration dictionary. We we'll look at all aspects of the compositions of the headwords. When it comes to alphabetical sequencing, which is the standard for arranging headwords in the dictionary, there are differences between South and North Korean dictionary which predate Korean American Sajon, it was decided that initial consonants in the dictionary would basically follow the South Korean order, while doubling consonants would follow the North Korean, which puts double consonants after single consonants. So, as you can see from this slide, this is the finally arranged and agreed the double vowels will be arranged after single vowels. The final agreed alphabetical sequence is as follows. Such an agreement on the sequence and the names of the characteristics in one of the most important types of the progress made in the compilations of Korean American Sajon. Selections of headwords in Korean American Sajon was based on South Korea's standard Korean language dictionary and North Korea's great dictionary of Korean language, while words missing from each basically are classified as new words. Of the words and the corpus established in literatures and technical books and newspapers published in South and North Korea, Yanbyon, China, Russia, those that are registered, the standard Korean language dictionary of the Great Dictionary of Korean Language are called new words in literature. Korean American Sajon, which aims for the language integration of South and North Korea, does not seek to unify the differences in language between South and North Korean unless there is a problem in orthography are made up of native words, Sino-Korean words, combined the terms using loan words, derivative words, compound words, and idioms. For example, the two Koreas agreed to use the orthography of native words that are frequently used by both nations, such as Taigal or Takal, and also Kondegi and Kondegi, instead of unifying them, showing that the two Koreas have chosen to recognize and respect each other's linguistic practice. In the dictionary, there is no distinction between the standard and non-standard words. All headwords are of equal value. This means that while the two Koreas treat each other's usage of the language equally, they also recognize each other's social systems, leading to the possibility of a to be a cultural model to recognize differences between their systems and respect each other while seeking coexistence. This means that the philosophy reflect Korean American Sajon can be lead to an ideal situation in South 
2000 North Korea after unification. However, the principle is not applied to every head words. For loan alls, the, the dictionary compares each of them in detail instead of considering their orthography principle. In terms of the loan word orthography, there are cases where a word form different from the South and North in chosen of the head word. For example, lingel were the South and North Korea's words from a chosen head word. For example, stocking or stocking and stocking. As such, the criteria for selecting head words for loan words is somewhat vague and inconsistent. This reflects irregularity in settlement patterns caused by the fact that South and North Korea brought in loan words at different times and into different fields. The gap between South and North Korea's grammar descriptions about grammatical forms, such as postpositional particles ending and affixes, is quite large. In South Korea, postpositional particles are considered word and treated as a part of speech, but endings are not considered words. On the other hand, North Korea postpositional particles ending in some affixes with grammatical functions are considered as two. So the dictionary considering Korean language as a agglutinative once there is no sub category two. Now let's go into the microstructure. The most characteristic part of the dictionary microstructure is an example. The dictionary suggests examples that fully explain the meaning of head words through the corpus established with the literature from South and North Korea and other countries, for example, from South and North China, and evenly possible. So we can know which language is used in which regions. The method, the, uh, sorry, this differs from the existing Korean dictionaries that separate North Korean words from South Korean through the use of separate head words for the former, and the dictionary prepared the ground for integration of the Korean lexicon by providing examples from each region. You are looking at the example, Dongmo, Kaibaibo, Nilshin, Sakona. All of these are the examples, as you can see here based on the words that we have collected in different regions we are trying to pursue a new explanations and you can see that we have combined and mostly the feature is that everything is based on this and the method of presenting the exhibitions was decided later but it was temporarily continued to show in the name of the artist for South Korea and Chinese works and only name of the North Korean works that constitute the work and for each example a reference with a mark and is given so the reader can know where and how the head word is used. The Korean American Sajan provides information about the origin of head words, historical information on the Korean language. The example you are looking at is a Kangaji Sab. You can see that they provide information, the meaning of that use, usage, refined words, and orthography in the attachment. It is also provides unified information on the loan words from South and North Korea. Karemakin Sajan serves to integrate vocabulary from South and North Korea and other regions, revealing that Korean vocabulary has one root, the same root, through information in the attachment. Before the 2000, the South and North Korean use of the language focused on combining what was divided, but now the focus is on recognizing both languages, that is, putting them on equal footing and integrating them. Such an integration is in line with the purpose behind the compilation, Kyorema Kinsajon, for which the goal was for publication to occur in 2019 so that the asset of the Korean language will increase after unification. Fourth, Kyorema Kinsajon as an evolving dictionary. Hong 2007 pointed out that compilation of a dictionary is not complete even when it is published and that its compilation process begins again, therefore arguing compilation should continue even after publication of Karimai Kinsajan. Oxford English Dictionary was first planned, publishing 12 volumes and also German dictionary became the German dictionary even while Germany was divided and 
Since the first publication in 1999, the standard Korean language dictionary has continued to be revised and supplemented. Such compilation should continue as long as target language continues to be used. Previously, the features of Korean American Sajon as a language integration dictionary have been described. In this chapter, we will examine Korean American Sajon as an evolving and open dictionary. Korean American Sajon does not adopt single orthography. South and North Korea established a form orthography subcommittee with the Korean American Sajon Committee, Korean American Sajon, and have consistently discussed orthography for quite some time. The orthography that has not been agreed is initial law, inter, shi, ot, pyo, pe, and kun. The details of agreement between South and North Korea on the non agreed definition notations are when it comes to letter that each side is charged of writing, the notation of that side shall be until agreement is reached. The dictionary will be published next year, so headwords for which no agreement has come about are presented as one entry. As you can see, Koryongwa, Shinpe, these are the examples. For dictionary users, this orthography forms is confusing. However, if you understand that Kyore American Sajon records the process of its compilation involving South and North Korea and is not designed to force unification to either South or North Korean, it can be evaluated as simply another feature of Kyore American Sajon. Yun suggested in 2019 several things important to the process of compiling a joint dictionary of South and North Korean based on China and Taiwan experience. There are a couple of items that we need to consider. First is to put language usage of South and North Korea on equal footing. Second, principle and flexibility should be clear part of compilation process. Third, clarify definitions based on the literature corpus. Fourth, problem should be put on hold if they cannot be resolved quickly. These four suggestions are in accordance with the principle behind compilation of Korean American Sajon. And instead of hastily trying to resolve the problems on hold, rather than doing that, we need to find solution not limited to the selections or definition of head words, but can be applied to an agreement to form orthography. The joint compilation guidelines written in Pyongyang in 2005 also include an article on this of the dictionary compilation principle. And one by one, we need to find a solution. And con constantly, we should supplement the dictionary. Thanks to this principle, work on Kyore American Sajon has continued over the tens of years despite political and social change. Not only in form of orthography, but also in the composition of head words, Korean American Sajon is an evolving dictionary. Of a planned total of 330,000 head words agreed by South and North Korea to be registered in the dictionary, 300,000 300, have been completed, meaning there is a room remaining for 23,000 words. Once those 23,000 new words from North Korea are written in, Korean American Sajon will be more complete. 2018 said the fact that Korean American Sajin is a unified dictionary of South and North Korean is the first step, not the final step, as the compilation is an evolving dictionary, not a finished one. And Hong 2013, Hong Jong Sung 2013 argues that one of the significance of Korean American Sajon is that it is helping to build a social and cultural foundation for unification of South and North and its compilation pursue unification of the language of South and North Korea through integration. As a major step toward establishing such foundation, Hong states that it is essential that it is done before political unification, not after. Korean American Sajon is a significant project in the history of a compilation of a Korean language dictionary. The dictionary itself is expected to be sought after publication in the field of lexicography and as relates to the history of linguistic culture 
considering the past hundred years of the language history. Sometimes Korean has proven a cultural asset as it preserved proof of national independence and is a major factor in enriching people's life. Now it is serving as a bridge to realize the integration of South and North Korea, the process where a modern nation presupposed that a single ethnic language should be used for the nation shown, the language and politics are closely related. However, the process of compiling Korean American Sajun is an evidence that we are removing past times when one powerful standardized language is dominant. Instead, we are pursuing a, the coexistence of a range of language variants. In the 20th century, deciding a standard form from among many variants of the Korean language was the mainstream in language policy, but in the 21st century, preserving variations and respecting diversity of language is becoming the trust. The fact that it presents an image of the Korean language of going from unification to integration amidst of these changes make the dictionary more meaningful. Beginning from the two standardized dictionary, North Korean Great Dictionary of Korean Language and South Korean Standard Korean Language Dictionary implies practical problems in the project shows that two variants can coexist. Karema Kinsajon is a dictionary which integrates the language as used in South Korea, North Korea, and in other regions where Korean is used. And it is an evolving dictionary in progress, while integration of the Korean used in this area is not yet complete. Korean American Sajun is a linguistic project which shows the place where we stand right now and where we'll be in the future. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yu Yong-kyung. The integration of language, Korean American Sajun, has the features and significance. Let me introduce the next speaker. And we'll have the next presentation by Professor Emeritus of University of Bonn, Albert Hube. But before the presentation, there is a, a quite uh, there's a asking of your understanding. We are having a slight delay. Uh, this is, of course, because uh, everybody is uh, wishful of uh, engaging in greater discussion and presentation for today's topic. Uh, but I'd like to apologize on behalf of uh, the organization. But because we have following schedules, I'd like to kindly ask you to be more mindful of uh, the time limitation. And with that, I'd like to now hand over the microphone to Professor Hube for his presentation on the reality of local languages in East and West Germany since unification. Good afternoon. I am deeply honored to be invited to today's forum. Thank you very much. The presentation is on the reality of local languages in East and West Germany since unification. But before the presentation, I'd first like to talk about the political background and the linguistic background in Germany. The division of Germany, I myself experienced the division of Germany and also lived through the divided Germany. So, in a sense, I may kind of playing a role of a live witness to the division and unification of Germany. After the war, when you look at the German-speaking area, there are these types of dialects. There isn't a need to talk about each of the dialects, but from the north, the south, the west, and the east, we can observe that there are so many different dialects in Germany. So just by looking at the dialects alone, it seems as if Germany is almost somewhat divided in terms of its language usage. When you think about Germany, 
today, we can mainly think of the three main variants. They are Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. For example, these are the small uh, bread type that, that the German enjoy. And depending on where this is uh, called, in the northern part, it's called Brechen. In the western part and southern part of Germany, including Switzerland, it is called Wecken. And in the eastern part of Germany, including Austria, the same type of bread is called Semmel. They all denote the same small bread. And even this example shows how many variants there are of a single definition. Also, for the past form and the past tense in German, you have to have haben, which is to have or sign to be in English. In the northeast side, it's called haven, but in the southern part, it's used, it's used as sign. Even though both term tenses are used, since I grew up in the southern part of Germany, uh, the first tense that comes to me whenever I speak is sign. So this is another denominator of uh, an indicator of the regional differences and variants of the German language. Since there has been so many varieties, it is quite complicated to exactly define a standard German language. The process of standardizing German was when Martin Luther translated the Bible into the German language. And through that, many German people could read the Bible in German. And Luther was also from East Germany. That is why he translated the Bible in uh, East German dialect. And in Switzerland, another person called Swingli also translated the Bible. The translation by Luther, Luther played a bigger role in standardizing the German language. And when the German language was fully standardized was from the 19, early 19th century of the Weimar classicism, and Goethe and Schiele and such scholars that are well known and the writers well known in Korea were also of this century. And today, originally I didn't fill this slide, but these are very important concepts. In Germany, there isn't a kind of a government body like the Ministry of Education of Korea. And the standardization of the German language depends on indirect bodies. There isn't a single top-down authority that uh, supervises that process. For example, if I work at University of Bonn, then the University of Bonn will communicate with me about a certain grammatical rule and standards, and then an uh, indirect proposal will be made by the school. 
And the national education system is also different according to the different federal states. So, in a sense, all of this system is indirect, not a direct top down, just like in Korea. There are at least six regions that use the German language as its main language. It is Germany, Austria, uh, and Switzerland, and Belgium, and Voltanado, and Luxembourg. Voltanado is the northern province of Italy. These are the six regions where uh, representatives are appointed from their respective agencies, and the representatives become members of the Council for German Spelling. And the Council for German Spelling is based in Mannheim, which is also very famous in Korea. The Leibniz Institute for the German Language is its title. Is, uh, this is uh, the Language Institute, where the council is located at, and the, these six representatives makes decisions on the spelling of the German language. And once the decision is made by the council, this is then sent to the Duden, and the Duden Dictionary will enlist those decisions. And the Duden is also not an official or semi-official uh, dictionary. It is rather published by a private publisher. So it plays a kind of an official or semi-official role. It is not mandatory to acknowledge this as a single standard. That is the uh, nature of Germany. I talked about German and the standard German language. When you look at the political and social conditions, this is what we can observe. When you look at the national flags, I think this expresses the basic situation very clearly. The East Germany flag originally was identical to the West German flag. I was also astonished that until 1959, the two flags between East and West Germany uh, were the same. But from 1959, the central emblem was attached. So when you compare this with the two national flags of South and North Korea, we can tell that the national flags of South Korea and that of DPRK are starkly different. And this seems to reflect the basic conditions of the division of the nation. Because of the division, there were more than 1,000 deaths in Korea. But what is quite uh, tragic to say, this is nothing compared to that in Korea. I found out that about 4.5 million people lost their lives because of the Korean War itself. So this is something that goes beyond comparison between the two countries. When you look at this slide, this shows the situation after division between West and East Germany, and you can tell that uh, exchange between the two Germanys continued. If you retire in East Germany, you are allowed to travel to West Germany. And and we could have conversations between each other. And for those that engaged in publication and in the artistic activities and literary activities, 
They were also allowed on work trips to West Germany. And from the West German side, well, on the bottom part, it says radio and the television was partially allowed in the east and that was why i could also listen and watch the listen to the radio and watch the tv in east germany when i was young of course the system was different because the west germans were not that interested in the east german television this is a very critical condition about the television. In the bottom part, you can see that the West German television was something, whether it's day or night, it was so popular among East Germans. It was actually illegal, but virtually every East German citizen, I don't know, if it's really 100%, but almost the majority of East German citizens back then would watch the West German TV, even though the system was different. There is a German history museum, and it tells how East German, how smart East Germans were to develop a specific type of antenna and other things to watch the West German television programs. And this all shows how popular West German TV programs were in East Germany. Also, through the West T German TVs, East Germans became very well aware about the West German situation and West Germans were all allowed to enter East Germany and bring their own money. Particularly between West and East Germany, the Christian church had a very close relationship. They provided financial support and Chancellor Merkel and her father moved from Hamburg to East Germany in 1954 as, as a priest. And the previous president, uh, Joachim Gauck, was also originally a pastor. So this also enabled the inter-German exchange. And between West and East Germany, there was an acknowledgement of each other. And also, there were treaties for such acknowledgement and cooperation. At the same time, writers were also allowed to travel to East Germany. And the same was true for singers. They could visit East Germany. Since I don't have enough time, I'll move on. Also, in standardizing the spelling, East Germany also continued with their cooperation and support. Uh, the person called Dieter Nurius, uh, a German professor, he was the president of the East German Academy and president of Spelling Council. And we would always get together and they were all sent to Duden. This is just one example. And another related example is related to the first chairman of the state council. When West Germany and East Germany were established in 1949, 
The first chairman of the State Council of East Germany said that since the East Germany, that is GDR, was established as a state of workers and peasants, the German language in GDR would change accordingly. That is, a forced variety of German had emerged. So this is the mapping. We should take a look whether that is really relevant. When you look at the official names, there's first the official name is Bundesrepublik Deutschland. And the East German's official name is DDR. But for the national name, well, please, uh, I apologize. Calling a name in such acronyms is something I truly feel heartbreaking. And East Germany, West Germany is called as BRD. And East Germany was called DDR in West Germany. But today, the BRD that was originally used in East Germany sometimes is used to call the entire Germany. I think this is somewhat vague. In the past, if you say BRD, you could tell that that is a person that is quite pro-East German. Well, I must pass this slide, go, oh, but let me move on, on to the next. There are different divisions which are called differently between East and West Germany. First, the parliament is called Bundestag in West Germany and the People's Chamber in East Germany. When you look at the East German namings, you can see that there are many acronyms. Originally, the list of the acronym was enormously long in the Wikipedia. But compared to that, they are hardly none in West Germany. So when you go to East Germany, and when people talk about acronyms, it was almost impossible to understand. And another thing I must tell you is, which is very important, is that East German people were very smart. In official settings, they used official expressions expressions like absolute or heroic or conscious workers were very frequently used. Well, these are quite unrealistic. Nevertheless, such expressions were frequently used in East Germany in the official context. So, Expressing the emotion was not quite possible in these official settings, but once the citizens were at their home, once they're inside their houses, they would switch immediately into the normal German language that is similar to the West German language with their families. It was kind of a dual language life in East Germany. And uh, there were many acronyms in East Germany, but in West Germany, uh, there were many anglicism words such as airlines and highlight uh, and also combination of German and English words. But in East Germany, this was not something familiar to them. So. These West German expressions were quite new and uh, strange to East Germans. I'm almost nearing the end of my presentation. Uh, 
During the period of division, the dictionary, Duden, was published. It continued to be published in two different editions. Uh, a German, East German edition and a West German edition were published. And then in 1991, the United Public Edition was published. So it would be meaningful to compare how different the two German languages uh, became. And this was a very useful reference. In 1967, it's uh, the 18th year after division. And the term DDR and BRD were not enlisted in as headwords. There were only the headword called Deutschland. But words like, words like World Tour or Coup d'etat did not exist in the East German edition while it was in the West German edition. And in East Germany, uh, the German people were more conservative than West Germans in using and uh, publishing their words. And after unification, one thing to pay tribute is that the preparation for unification was done in a very calm and meticulous manner. And when you look at these uh, three uh, these uh, thick three books, we can tell that only 3% of the German language changed during the division. And these are mainly the terms that I explained just now. And regarding the grammar and the pronunciation, it is known that the difference did not develop. And this, I'm almost at my end of the presentation. In 2017, there was the first and the second report of the German language published, first in 2013 and then in 2017 by the Union of the German Academies of Sciences and the German Academy for Language and Literature. And in the reports, there aren't any references about any negative effects of the division on the language. As a matter of fact, there is no negative impact on the ordinary lives of people that use the German language. It could be kind of a self appraisal. In 2019, I published this book titled The Hangul That Has Wings. And based on the Hun Min Jung -un character alphabet, I used the Hun Min Jung -un alphabet to provide solutions to all the information related issues. First is the inter-Korean related issue. When you look at the Hun Min Jung -um, you can see this systematic order. And the reason why I wanted to share this slide as my last slide is because as a person that experienced division and also as someone who also witnessed unification and also as a scholar studying the Hangul character, I am somewhat mesmerized with the power of the Hangul character. So I believe that the Korean language will provide a solution to overcome division through its own unique way. With that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Apologize for taking too long.
Professor Hubei, thank you very much for your wonderful Korean presentation. You compared the situation in German and its uh, division in the German language and efforts for unification in German. Thank you very much. Before Professor Laws King's presentation, we originally had a break, but due to time consideration, we'd like to invite Professor Ross King. As a third presentation, uh, we'd like to invite the presentation of Professor Ross King of University of British Columbia. Uh, because uh, of the time difference in Canada, uh, he will not attend this online live, but he has sent a video presentation on the language village concept in residential immersion, Concordia language villages, and Susuki Hosu, the Korean language village. Good evening. The, record, the organizers of this forum have honored me with a request for a short presentation on the unique educational model developed by Concordia Language Villages with some words about the Korean language village in particular and its relevance to minority language maintenance. I should start then with a full disclaimer. I attended the Spanish, German, and Russian language villages from age 11 to 18 every summer throughout the 1970s, serving on staff at both Valse and Lesnoya Ozira in the summers of 1978 and 79 before matriculating at university. I returned 20 years later to launch Supsoge Hosu, the Korean language village, and led that program until 2013. Currently, I serve as Dean Emeritus of the Korean language village and as a member of CLV's National Advisory Council. Thus, I have an intimate first-hand acquaintance with the language village idea, both as a learner and as a staff member. And it is fair to say that my career as a linguist and language educator owes everything to my formative experiences as a villager at CLV in the 1970s. The academic literature on second language acquisition is vast, and the literature on heritage and minority language education and maintenance is equally robust. But one author whose insights I have found inspiring across language pedagogy, literature in the language classroom, and especially questions of affect in language teaching with respect to adolescents and young adults is Claire Crumpsch. It is especially her trenchant critiques of language pedagogy in US schools that ring true for me, beginning with her classic Crumpsch 1993 and her discussion of authentic texts and contexts. She says, quote, authentic speech is often presented and read in language classes in the same uncritical way as such languages used by most native speakers, as if, the la as if the classroom could ever be or even should ever try to imitate the natural environment of restaurants and workplaces. End quote. So let us agree that classrooms are generally not an easy place in which to create authentic opportunities for foreign language use. Now on affect. Here is Crouch 10 years later commenting on the pleasure of annexing a foreign language, as she calls it, as revealed in a university student's code mixing in her language learning journal. Quote, the code switching in this journal entry suggests the often untapped resources of language learners who take intense physical pleasure in acquiring a language, thrill in trespassing someone else's territory, becoming a foreigner on their own turf, becoming both invisible and differently visible. End quote. Crouch delves deeper into this question of affect in language learning in her preview article on the multilingual subject, where she invokes Julia Kristeva's notion of desire as follows. Quote, the first thing one notices when reading the testimonies of foreign language users is the intensity of their multilingual experiences. Second language acquisition research has bypassed a large domain of what makes us human, namely the need to identify with another reality than the one that surrounds us. This need for identification with others, with their language, their way of speaking is so strong that Kristeva gave it the name desire. She goes on, in language learning, desire is first of all escape, the urge to escape from a state of tedious conformity with one's present environment to a state of plenitude and enhanced power. Many adolescents find in a foreign language a new mode of expression that enables them to escape from the confines of their own grammar and culture. What does this excursion into the work of Claire Crumps have to do with Concordia language villages? I submit that in the 60 years since CLV began programming in 1961, it has crafted an approach to language education that solves many of the problems with authenticity 
faced by language teaching that takes place within the four walls of a traditional classroom and succeeds brilliantly at creating a learning environment where young learners can forge a visceral and lifelong connection to another language and culture. And in the case of numerous less commonly taught languages, CLV is virtually the only place in North America where young people can undertake sustained study of them at the K-12 level. So let me give you an overview of the Concordia language villages. CLV is a not-for-profit educational institution affiliated with Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. Based in Bemidji, Minnesota, in the Minnesota Northwoods, CLV currently consists of the 15 language villages you see here. Over the years, the oldest and best established villages have been able to build culturally authentic year-round facilities clustered on the substantial CLV land holdings on the southern arm of Turtle River Lake in Bemidji. German, French, Spanish, Norwegian, Russian, Finnish, and Swedish all enjoy authentic winterized sites on the same lake while other villages lease sites from the many church and YMCA-owned YMCA facilities located in the land of 10,000 lakes that is northern Minnesota. CLV's institutional mission is inspiring courageous global citizens. The mission statement itself does not mention language or culture, but CLV strives to fulfill its mission precisely through experiential language and culture education in a residential immersion environment. These are camp experiences centered on language and culture. Over the years, CLV has developed a number of core immersion principles that guide all curriculum and programming. These are giving courage, learner-centered education, an authentic setting, creating a need to communicate, experiential education, and extended projects. Academic treatments of the history of immersion language education in North America often cite Canada in the year 1966 as starting point. So it is interesting to note that CLV began slightly earlier in 1961. Language immersion in a school classroom and in a residential summer camp setting differ in a number of key respects and neither can guarantee, let alone enforce, 100% use of the target language. The guiding principle at CLV is that all programming all day long, 24 seven, is conducted in the target language, unless the health and safety and or emotional well-being of a villager is at risk. In practical terms and somewhat facetiously, this is sometimes presented to staff members in training as use the target language unless you see blood or tears. But the point is that CLV endeavors to create a welcoming and encouraging and caring environment. CLV does not use language pledges or penalize the use of, of English, nor is error correction encouraged on the part of staff. Instead, the emphasis is on modeling correct usage and creating a rich system of incentives and rewards for the use of the target language. Typical villager to staff ratios of four or five to one make for a rich language environment where literally every single adult that the villagers encounter is there for their language learning, something that an educational experience abroad can by no means guarantee. Currently, CLV summer programs attract 5,000 villagers every year from all 50 US states and 18 other countries. The Korean language village now routinely attracts 90 to 100 villagers from 25 to 32 different states and one or two other countries and can no longer accommodate demand in its current site and limited dates. Another 5,000 villagers attend CLV programs during the academic year, and CLV hires over 1,000 staff each year from 34 different countries. There is a wide gamut of programs on offer, including adult programming and family programming, as well as specialized program, programs for corporate clients and branches of the U.S. Armed Forces, but the heart and soul of CLV programming continues to be summer programs in the form of two-week and four-week high school credit programs, the latter being fully accredited to provide the minimum equivalent of 180 hours of high school classroom instruction, thus allowing students to receive credit from their high school. Some language villages also offer high school credit abroad and even college credit courses. As mentioned above, CLV launched the Korean language village in the summer of 1999. Initial demand for Supsoge Hosu in Minnesota came from the parents of Korean adoptees the Korean adoptee community in Minnesota being quite large, but the intention was always to build a Korean language village welcoming 
to, a, to any and all villagers, regardless of background or motivation. After I stepped down in 2013, leadership of the KLV passed to Dr. Daphne Zur, pictured here, Associate Professor of Korean Language and Literature at Stanford University. Currently, we use the Russian language village during the five weeks of the summer when it is vacant, but demand for Korean has grown impressively in recent years, and we are now routinely turning away villagers, especially with a four-week high school credit program. As good luck would have it, there is still space on CLV's land holdings around Turtle River Lake for at least one more year-round village site, and the Korean language village was fortunate enough to receive in 2019 a generous lead gift of $5 million from Mr. Kenny Park, CEO of the Simone Corporation and a longtime benefactor of the village in Seoul. This gift has allowed the Korean language village to begin construction on a year-round site designed by a leading architect in Seoul, but it will take several more years to complete the village and it will eventually look uh, like what you see here in the slide. It is currently under construction. Enrollments at the Korean language village have tended to average 90 to 100 per summer, but this is simply a function of how many beds we have currently and how many weeks of programming we can run. Once the year-round site is up and running, we anticipate that enrollments will rise substantially. The Korean language village has also been fortunate thus far to be able to offer some form of financial aid to approximately one-third of its villagers. Costs for a CLV summer program run approximately $1,000 per week, which is standard for most residential camps, but by no means affordable for many families. The Korean language village's educational philosophy is simple. Korean is a world language for all. In Korea, this phrase, Korean is a world language, has been misinterpreted as KLV somehow advocating that Korean be promoted as an international language like English, because the term Segeo in Korean is ambiguous in this sense. But the point is that Korean language education in the USA should no longer be conceived of by Koreans and especially by Korean Americans as uniquely reserved for those of Korean heritage. It is a world language in the sense that Korea is a major country on the world stage with a long and proud history and many achievements. And therefore Korean is a language that anybody and everybody for any number of reasons should want to study. Currently, the Korean language village's demographics are as follows. 15% adopted Koreans, another 15% of what we call chagabe, which is the Soviet Korean word for a child with one Korean parent, 10% first, I'm sorry, second and third generation Korean Americans, and 60% non-heritage learners. We have been seeing a gradual but nonetheless conspicuous rise in villagers with Korean surnames at the Korean language village. First-generation Korean-American parents would never send their children to a program like KLV if a Korean community school was available, but second-generation Koreans typically report less than favorable experiences at Korean community schools and are usually incapable of passing on the language themselves to their children, so we are seeing a gradual rise in the number of third-generation Korean-Americans. The language village experience and curriculum is broadly similar across all CLV programs. The first day of village life is opening day when villagers arrive at customs. Prior to arrival, they have already received a passport in the mail, which also includes in it their bank book. At customs, they check in and find out which cabin they will live in, typically named after a province or city in the target culture. Crucially, they receive a new village name and identity, symbolized by their name tag, which must be worn henceforth at all times. English language names are not used in the village. They also deposit all their US dollars at the bank and receive a small amount of Korean currency for use at the village department store and kiosk. When day two and regular daily routines start, the days are filled with a combination of large group activities and evening programs, small group cultural and language focused activities, lots of singing and dancing, indoor activities, outdoor activities, culturally authentic meals, and free time structured to encourage target language use. Villagers in the four week high school credit program have more language uh, focused sessions, but the point is that villagers do everything they would do at, say, YMCA camp, except that everything is in Korean, the staff all speak Korean, many are from Korea, and all the villagers are there with the express purpose of learning Korean. 
when the site being used is not our own, as it is at present, we do everything we can to add flavor with authentic realia. The ultimate goal is to create an authentic community-based learning environment where everybody feels like family and where the village is just that, family, and is emphatically not school. If at the end of two weeks or four weeks, staff and villagers alike are not in tears on closing day, something has gone wrong. The return rate from one summer to the next averages 40%. So can the CLV model contribute to the maintenance or preservation of minority languages? The answer to this question depends on how we define minority and heritage language and also on what we mean exactly by maintenance and preservation, but the answer would have to be at least a qualified yes. Qualified because CLV has never consciously positioned itself as a force for the preservation of minority and heritage languages, preferring instead to align itself with the discourse of foreign language education. But for all practical purposes, it has nonetheless come to serve this purpose in the case of certain languages. If we accept that English has become a glottophagic language throughout the globe, and especially in the USA, and if we define minority and heritage languages as any languages in the USA that are not English, while also recalling that the USA functions as a kind of graveyard for immigrant languages beyond the third generation, by definition, the CLV educational model emerges as a kind of language maintenance mechanism for those learners whose participation in CLV programs is motivated by heritage considerations. This is clearest in the case of the Nordic language villages. The impetus and funding for them has come from immigrant groups and foundations like the Sons of Norway and the Salolampi Foundation, while an overwhelming proportion of the vill villagers attending the Norwegian, Finnish, Swedish, and Danish language villages come from families of Nordic heritage, but are typically separated from the heritage language by more than four generations. Given the almost total lack of educational opportunities at the K-12 level in these languages in the USA, CLV emerges as a precious resource for reconnecting with these languages for learners with heritage-related motivation. By contrast, the Italian language village and the Arabic language village were established with high hopes that significant numbers of villagers would materialize soon from Italian and Arabic-speaking communities in the US, but so far this has not happened yet. Neither community is accustomed to sending its children far away from home to summer camp. And in the case of Arabic speaking communities, community-based educational resources closer to home seem destined to be more popular until the three generation threshold has been crossed. An additional case in point would be Native American languages. CLV is located in a part of Minnesota traditionally inhabited by speakers of Ojibwe and indeed a preponderance of the fewer than 1,000 remaining speakers of Ojibwe in the U.S. are located in Beltrami, the same Beltrami County, the same county that houses Concordia language villages. Over the decades, there have been occasional tentative conversations about the possibility of collaboration between CLV and leaders in Ojibwe-speaking communities keen to revitalize Ojibwe, but thus far, no concrete initiatives have emerged. With specific reference to Korean again, the problem in North America is similar to that of the Nordic languages. Whatever one's heritage or motivation, if one suddenly develops an urge to learn Korean before the age of 18, there is virtually nowhere to go to satisfy that urge. Few U.S. high schools offer instruction in Korean, and those few that do almost always do so exclusively for heritage learners who already speak it at home. Another reason for the qualified yes I gave is that the CLV, the CLV model is not easily replicated. It has taken CLV 60 years to acquire the resources and perfect the know-how to manage year-round operations in 15 different languages across many different types of programming. A certain organizational critical mass is necessary to launch a new language village. And while other singleton language village type programs have been attempted elsewhere, few have attained the longevity and scale of CLV. Nonetheless, there are certain pedagogical techniques and programming ideas that have proven effective at CLV that can be adapted to more traditional language learning classrooms, 
the potential for this kind of contribution on the part of CLV to minority and heritage language maintenance and preservation is likewise large, but thus far has been inhibited by a lack of funding, a lack of PR, as well as by a lack of sustained interest from heritage communities themselves. Let me finish with this final slide, uh, which shows on the left, Hamilton et al. 2005, which, is, uh, which brings together in one attractive and teacher-friendly volume a number of precisely such CLV ideas for adaptation in, classroom, uh, in, in American classrooms for teachers of foreign languages. An excellent Korean language edition of this same book was published in 2008 and in principle would be extremely helpful in injecting new ideas and methodologies into the more than 1,000 Korean community schools in operation across the USA, but the book has been poorly marketed and remains a bibliographic rarity. Interested readers are invited uh, to refer to these two books as well as to the list of publications that I have appended to the written version of this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. 네, 로스킨 교수님의 발제를 영상을 Thank you very much. Professor Loskin's presentation was given by the video clip. Once again, language village concept in residential immersion, Concordia language village, and Supsoge Hoso, the Korean village, was given. Now, one final presentation remains. The last presenter will be uh, Ms. Pyongyang Su, research manager of the compilation department of the Kyore American Sajan. She will present on the survey of the Korean language usage of overseas Korean for the Kyore American Sajan. Let us invite Ms. Pyongyang Su. And uh, hello, everybody. I'd like to present on the collection of and research on Korean language used by overseas Koreans for Kyodemal Kun Sajan. And this was to preserve the nation's linguistic heritage and to lay out the groundwork to collect sword and uh, eventually preserve the heritage. Basically, the Kyodemal Kun Sajan used the South Korea Standard Korean Language Dictionary and the North Korea's Great Dictionary of Korean Language to select existing headwords and at the same time for the new words that were not enlisted, uh, we also collected them for the compilation. For the new word uh, called collection, we collected the existing dialects and the written words. And for the dialects, we included the domestic dialects in each part of South Korea and also the dialects in overseas parts of uh, overseas regions. For overseas region, we included Yeonbyan and Kazakhstan as the main uh, focus of our study. The presentation I'd like to make is about it's not limited to the new vocabulary for the new compilation of the Kyoremal Kun Sajan, and it is on how we classify the new types and forms. And this is uh, limited to the words that were studied in Kazakhstan. Uh, the Kazakhstan is one of the countries where the Korean people who moved from Hamgyong province to Primorsky Krai in 1864 lived after being deported by Soviet Union. So in 1926, 98.9% of the Korean Russians spoke the Korean language as their mother tongue. But after that, in 1989, this had decreased to 49.4%. This me and this portion became lower and lower, so now a very minimum number of people use the Korean language in the Kazakhstan language. And in 1989, the Kazakhstan government had then proclaimed the decree on the usage of the Kazakh language, so many had to learn the Kazakh language uh, after the government adopted it as a national nation's official language, so they had to learn both Korean and the Kazakh language, and this caused a greater linguistic identity confusion for those that lived in the region. And when you look at the dialects, we could also study the Kazakhstan words as a dialect. A dialect uh, in, uh, is 
created with contact with the in a nearby regions, so it has its own identity as well as commonalities with the nearby regions. But at the same time, it has its isolated differentiation. So for the region, the languages we studied in Kazakhstan, where you compare them with the headwords of the standard Korean language dictionary and the great dictionary of Korean language, of course there were commonalities, but there were different and unique words. First on the identical type vocabularies, these were the words that were commonly enlisted in the two South and North Korean dictionaries. But as you can see in the examples, we did not uh, study a large or massive amount of vocabulary because uh, when we conducted the study, we we attempted to study new words that were not enlisted in the existing two dictionaries, so the existing headwords were filtered. So the overlapping words are not that big in its number. Nevertheless, when you show the, when I explain the classification, we can see uh, those that are. Uh, that are identical in terms of uh, normat in terms of being a normative language such as kituri kumjom kakshi which are common in the two languages and kodume is listed in the great dictionary of the korean language as i said since we focused on studying new words the overlapping or common words are not that big in number and the next is uh, the local language for both the standard korean language dictionary and the great dictionary of Korean languages, uh, many words were both listed in as headwords in the two dictionaries, but some were enlisted only in the standard Korean language dictionary, but some were enlisted only in the great dictionary of Korean language. Since they are identical to the existing enlisted headwords, so some must say this is meaningless. But when you look at the different dialects, such as Hanbok, Hangyeong, Hangye, or Yanggang regions, we can see that Basically, we see new locations, but in the previous uh, enlistings, uh, the location of Kazakhstan was not added as a dialect location. But since we conducted this study, we now found out a possibility of adding Kazakhstan as another location for the dialect of the Korean language. So there is the meaning of it. And then, there is a different type of vocabulary, which are those that are not enlisted in the dictionaries, and we can classify them into two categories. The first is uh, those that have a similar type that are not, while not being enlisted in the two dictionaries, and another would be a totally different type. So for the similar forms, uh, it would be based on the existing headwords, there could be variants for example, insertions or eliminations of consonants or uh, ver vowels, or could be alternations of co consonants or vowels. And in 3.2, I'll introduce a new types. And this is something that cannot be explained by such phonetic variations. First on the consonant insertion and elimination, when you look at the study, the consonant insertion is about the insertion of kyok, niun, or lir. And for example, yuhada, the existing headwork in the Kazakhstan region, is pronounced ryuhada with the insertion of the consonant lir. And in the case of uh, the consonant elimination, kyok, iung, kyut would be eliminated in many cases. For example, for the existing headword palmyonghada in Kazakhstan, it was said palmyonghada when the lil consonant was eliminated. And in case of consonant alternation, such as kyok or iung, and there will be other examples, so when a nasalization occurred based on the existing headwords, or for niung, iung, iung, so alternations. These could be the categories. For example, the existing headword tantanada was called was pronounced tantanada in Kazakhstan where alternation of niun and iung took place. And also for the vowel variants of existing headwords, there could be a vowel insertion or vowel out well we couldn't see many cases of vowel insertion or el elimination. Actually, we couldn't see many cases of vowel elimination, but there were cases of vowel insertion and alternation. 
So, for example, Gülse, the headword was uh, pronounced Gülse, and uh, we could see such a kind of an insertion. And in case of vowel alternation, so we see a greater variety based on the existing enlisted headwords. We could see a vowel fronting or vowel backing or high vowel or low vowel instances also. And the existing headwords could go through vowel rounding or vowel unrounding in the different cases. And there could be the insertion of semi-vowels or the elimination of semi-vowels. So when you look at these types in 3.1, um, compared to the existing enlisted headwords, we could see the insertion or elimination or alternation of vowels or consonants, which could be phonetic variations. In 3.2, this could be a more detailed type. This is based on, uh, this is something that cannot be explained uh, com when you compare the new words uh, to the existing enlisted head words. So this is a category of new forms, and uh, we could classify them based on their morphological relevance and semantic relevance. For morphological relevance, we could also think of both vocabularies, vocabularies combined with all or part of an existing headword, or a different form itself. For the first, for the vo uh, combined words, we could think of 가슴 문에 국수 같이 나머지 눈뜨미 매콤의 멋을 말을 전일 분석. So when we look at the study vocabulary, these are the examples. Uh, in, when, in the word 가슴 거두메, in the existing enlisted, we see the same word in the enlisted uh, headword as a 함경 dialect. And this is a combination of 가슴 plus 거두메. And for 국식가비, uh, this is a combination of 국수, as we can presume. And in 나무아치, which refers to the tree branch, this is also another combination. So from a phonetic perspective, it cannot be explained, but this is entirely a new form. So it could be enlisted as a new form based on a combination of existing variants. And as a different form, it does not have relevance, any type of morphological relevance with the existing headword. So we could assume that this is something totally heterogeneical, heterogeneous. So when you look at the headwords themselves, it would be, in cases, difficult to think of the meaning and definition. For example, 거즈하다, 공누자, 능질매, 물꼽채, 방청꾼이, 승가, 원하다. These are some examples of the headless. When you look at the usage, it's difficult to understand. So naturally, uh, it is necessary to provide the definitions and explanations. To say that 거즈하다 means uh, doing, uh, cutting trees and 공누자 is uh, official uh, merchant. So in the Kazakhstan region, these were the words that were used in a limited way. And so for these types, it would be very desired to expand the study on such, the, on such new forms and different forms of vocabulary and continue its preservation. But for such, uh, not in addition to these different forms, we also found out that in terms of the syntax, we also found out uh, certain different forms. For example, uh, there is an example of karyomutjapta, which means that it's uh, it's not easy to make a decision or make a determination. And this is actually a compound. And with the word compound, if you want to make a negative form in the Korean sentence, it would normally uh, be written as 가려잡지 못하다. But in the Kazakhstan language or grammar, it says 가려못잡다. So we also discovered a syntax difference as well. But this isn't limited to 가려잡다 alone. And we discovered a couple of more examples. And next are semantic relevant uh, vocabularies that have semantic relevance. Uh, these are the words uh, that uh, are combined with existing headwords and came to have different meanings. And nari palkida and topke uh, and parun and these type of words are actually 
in the in listings of the existing dictionaries, but they they created new combinations and created new meanings. Nari, normally when you say nari, we could expect it will brighten, and then if it's night, then we would predict it will darken instead of brighten, but that was not necessarily the case. And for topta and kulta, which means warm and heat, then this is a combination which creates a word of making it warm and hot. And 원수를 갚다 is paying revenge. It is then combined into a new word, 원시를 하다. And 참을 그릇, which refers to a kettle in Kazakhstan, can also be, can also, we can also uh, refer to this meaning. And then there were cases when the existing semantic meaning was extended, or in cases, synonyms of existing headwords existed. For example, 거북하다, 고집하다, 달아나다, 씁쓸하다, 한심하다, 벼슬, 엔세아가 have their enlisted headwords in the existing dictionaries. But in Kazakhstan, it was discovered that the meaning was different. 거북하다 in Kazakhstan uh, means having bad luck, and 고집하다, unlike its meaning in Korean language, has a meaning of being humble. And for 씁쓸하다, we normally would think that the meaning would mean a bitterness of mind. But in Kazakhstan, it means that there's nothing wrong, uh, pretending there's no problem. So when you look at the same words with the same forms, the actual meanings would be different. And the same is true for Hanshimada. Uh, in Korea, it means somebody that's pathetic, but in the Kata language, it means dangerous. And Kyosul, which means a social position, it means a special knowledge in Kata language. So that has a different meaning that, than that is used in the native Korean language. And seaga is another example. In our language, it means it is normally the type of a, a title when, for example, the father-in-law would call his a daughter-in-law. But in Kazakhstan, this refers to a version. So there are certain uh, homonyms that are already enlisted headwords, but have dictionary, but have different meanings. And when you look at the headwords and their usages and definitions, we could also consider their linguistic relevances. For example, 강세다, 광비, 돌구미, 두둘레기, 완다. 강세다 is a combination which have different usages. 강세다, it means strong with great power. And 포구, 광비, means 포구. And 광 is actually a Chinese character referring to craziness, madness. So we can kind of uh, think that this word 광비 would mean a heavy rain. So we could then think of the possible semantic relevance. And the word 돌구미 refers to something that must be returned. When you look at the word 돌구미 alone, it is, we could think of any metaphorical relationship. And 두둘레기 refers to hitting one another and uh, fighting one another. We could think of uh, semantic relevance. So when you look at the origin and when you look at the morphological forms, it could be different, but there is a semantic relevance. Wandal means a full moon. So we can also think, when you think of the full moon, it is a round or complete moon. So one, uh, which is the first character of uh, Wanjon, which is completeness in Korea, then we can then we can pre expect Wandal to mean Ondal, a full moon. I now uh, present it on the different vocabulary types that we studied in Kazakhstan. 
And in Kazakhstan, we found out how uh, words and dialects identical to our normative languages, particularly vocabulary forms synonymous with those used in Hamgyong province in terms of uh, the historical regional characteristics. And we also found out uh, certain types that were unique in this region alone. But since this study was limited to Kazakhstan alone and our, it was focused only on the, the limited vocabulary that we collected, so there is a limitation in covering the entire Kazakhstan region and the vocabulary. And so a more systematic and intensive approach needs to be taken for the regions that possess valuable language resources in the need of preservation. With that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you. The research manager Pyon Young Su uh, conducted, uh, delivered a presentation on the survey of the Korean language used of overseas Korean for the Kyore Mal Kun Sajan based on the study in Kazakhstan. And now, this concludes all the presentations of the second session. We will now move on to the general discussion on the theme of collection and documentation of indigenous languages. I'd like to invite all the discussants up to the stage after the stage is ready. Tigusaganin,Yotke,Onoga,Tunjaikayo. 이렇게 사라져가는 토착 언어를 보전하는 일은 그 속에 담긴 지식과 경험, 역사를 보전하는 동시에 전 세계 언어와 문화의 다양성을 지켜내는 일이기도 합니다. 분단 이후 최초로 남과 북이 공동으로 편찬하고 있는 결의말 근사전은 지난 2019년부터 유엔이 지정한 세계 토착어의 해에 동참하는 동시에 지금의 언어를 수집, 기록해 나가는 사전 편찬 작업의 의미를 많은 세계 시민들과 공유하고자 이번 국제 학술 포럼을 준비하게 되었습니다. 2018년 10월 문재인 대통령과 오드레 아줄레 유네스코 사무총장의 접견을 통해 토착 언어와 결의말 근사전 남북 공동 편찬 사업에 대한 관심 요청을 계기로 국제 학술 포럼이 시작되게 되었습니다. 유네스코 결의말 근사전 국제 학술 포럼에서는 세계 토착 언어는 어떤 모습으로 기록되고 있는지 모두가 함께 지속 가능한 사회를 만들기 위해 토착 언어의 필요성에 대한 논의와 분단이라는 특수한 상황에서 통일이라는 과제를 앞둔 또는 이뤄낸 여러 국가의 사례를 통해 분단된 언어의 통합 문제 그리고 그 과정에서 사전의 역할과 결의말 근사전 편찬 사업의 의미를 살펴보는 소중한 시간이 될 것입니다. 인류의 소중한 유산 토착 언어의 지속 가능한 발전. 유네스코 결의말 근사전 국제 학술 포럼에 여러분을 초대합니다. So we are ready to start. All the panelists, please take your seats. We have prepared partition and you may take off your mask. 
네, 준비가 다된것 같은데요. So I guess we are ready to start the panel discussion. First of all, let me invite the moderator of the panel discussion, Professor Kim Jae Yong from Wonggang University. Professor Kim is joined through uh, via Zoom. Hello, everyone. Would you like to say hello to everyone? Yes, hello. I'd like to introduce other panelists. We have Dr. Jung Hee Won from the National Institute of Korean Language, Professor Kim Ha Su of Yonsei University, Professor Jo Nam Ho from Myeongji University. Last but not least, we have Professor Kim Hae Kyung from Ex Marseille University from France. Professor Kim is also joined virtually from France. And also with us, research manager Pyong and also Professor Mertos Ube and Professor Yu will be joined. So, Professor Kim, hello everyone. It is my great honor to take part as a moderator of the second panel discussion at the International Academic Forum. And the title of the panel discussion is Collection and Documentation of Indigenous Language. The panel discussion is uh, supposed to finish by 8 o'clock, so we have about an hour. And the panelists, please make sure to complete your uh, panel discussions in five minutes. And also, the speakers, please make sure to finish your remark within five minutes. First, let me make an overall comment. I tremendously enjoyed the presentation by four speakers, and also the case of Germany, the case of uh, University of British Columbia and Korea. I uh, enjoyed that very much. Any discussion or any comment, please go ahead. Let me begin. Yes, go on. Professor Kim. Hello, everyone. I'm currently residing in France. And let me introduce myself. My name is Kim Hegyong, in charge of Korean department at the ex Marseille University. Before making a comment, I am very honored to virtually join the International Academic Forum and also had a chance to see all the distinguished scholars. It is my great privilege and also pleasure. And also, it is amazing to see Professor Emeritus Hube, whose nickname I heard is the person who truly loves Korean more than what Korean people love. And also, Professor Rose King's uh, presentation, The Language Village Concept and Residential Immersions, Concordia Language Village. I enjoyed that very much. You talked a lot about uh, the Concordia Language Village and Subsoge Hosu, the Korean Language Village, in a very specific way. And you introduced how it is operated. I learned a lot. It was very impressive. I have a couple of questions regarding the Concordia Language Village. I have many questions, but let me pose two questions only. As communication approaches have been part of the mainstream foreign language education since 1980s, content-oriented foreign language education, which is closely related to immersive education, has spread in various ways in educational environments. While this approach has a positive effect on increasing learners' fluency, some point out that it is not as effective as some areas of language knowledge, especially in grammatical accuracy. I think that there may be cases where these concerns are raised for subsori hoso. In other words, I'd like to hear your views on the Korean language village learning plan to improve both fluency and accuracy. And I also have second question. Second question is, as you know, Korean language is loved by people around the world. I'll give an example. At the southern part of France, there is ex Marseille University. There are 75 students per year. 
and they learn Korean. And more than 1,200 students apply to enter our school. But what I'm concerned about is I do have a concern, and I'd like to pose a question to Professor Rose King. Well, Korean language and cultural research instructors do make sure that the popularity of Korean a minority language that has suddenly come to fore due to the current Korean wave. We don't want the Korean language zeal to cool off. And what should we do? What kind of efforts should we make? Thank you very much, Professor Kim Hae-kyung. Professor Rose King, as you have seen due to the time difference, because Professor King resides in Canada, that is why he sent us video clip. And regarding the questions raised by Professor Kim Hae-kyung, already Professor Rose King has written the answer. And one of the staff members of the organizer will read the answer. Well, uh, Professor Rose King already read the question and has written down the answers. And let me read his answer. It's written in English, so I'll be reading in English. So answer to the first question. Accuracy versus fluency. This is an excellent question. Unfortunately, because so much of the politically correct orthodoxy in second language acquisition comes out of the massive and hegemonic juggernaut that is English language education, Grammar has become a dirty word in foreign language education in North America. For an agglutinating language like Korean with robust morphology, grammar is very important, but gets swept under the carpet in most Korean language teaching programs. By contrast, Korean language education programs in Korea, I would contend, overemphasize grammar education. In fact, it's pr practically the only thing that they learn. However, while the four-week high school credit program at Supsoge Hosu does include form-focused instruction as part of its curriculum, the point of a language village is not to teach grammar. Error, cor error correction is discouraged, and instead, we focus on modeling correct forms. The point of the Supsoge Hosu is to give courage, instill love and enthusiasm for the Korean language culture and make sure the villager, villager wants to come back the next summer and then the next, and then eventually choose college on the basis of the availability of a Korean language program. He or she can learn about the intricacy of Korean grammar then. The language village is just the beginning of a lifelong journey. 다음 질문에 대한 답변입니다. Next. How do we prepare for the eventuality that the Korean wave will cool off? This is a real worry for me and takes me back to what I said in response to question one. Koreans, government, industry, private individuals, community organizations need to make substantial long-term investments now and for as long as they can at far greater levels than now. Korea is no longer a poor country and spends a fortune on English language education. It can afford to spend more on Korean. Korean language education has made great strides since the 1990s outside Korea, but the progress made to date is very fragile and could be wiped away very easily. Korean media reports exaggerate the progress made and focus on superficial headline-grabbing good news stories. But the long-term prognosis is still extremely fragile because we're not seeing the long-term investments that were made for Japanese language studies 50 years ago and which are now sustaining Japanese language education in North America. 네, 이상입니다. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The language between South and North Korea, because Korea, two Koreas were divided into two, but Koreans are loved by other countries around the world. Amid that, there were some concerns, and Professor Kim raised those questions, and Professor Rose King answered that. If there are any other comments or questions about the presentation, please feel free to ask a question or raise hands.
I'm Jung Yuan. I'm a researcher at the National Institute of the Korean Language. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, conducted by South and North Korea, uh, we are striving for the compilation of the Gyeolemal Kunsajon. Upon listening to the presentation, I sincerely hope that our dreams can be realized. It is about to actually realize, and my heart is throbbing. Especially upon listening to the presentation by Professor Yu Hyun Kyung of Yonsei University, I have one question, and also I'd like to share my impression. Professor Yun, you have shared us the significance and also the importance of compiling Kyoremal Kinsajon. And upon listening to your presentation, I was able to fully understand the significance of this dictionary. And also, you talked about uh, the importance of two things. Instead of just pursuing unification in one way, we need to encompass two languages used between North and South Korea, and we need to integrate these two languages, and thereby we can flourish and also enrich our language and also further develop Korean language. And you have used different language, different terminology by saying that, and. Here, I'd like to hear more explanations about how you are going to do the uh, ongoing or progressive dictionary. The moment that we publish dictionary, we need to continuously modify that. Also, you talked about Oxford University, but also there is a standard Korean language dictionaries and other dictionaries. And as we live in a society where language is constantly used and sometimes certain vocabularies dissipate or a new words appears, and that is why we need to constantly come up with ways to record those uh, words. However, you mentioned that it has very unique significance because this is an ongoing project and you emphasize the importance of the progressiveness. So if you can elaborate, it would be very helpful. Next thing, upon listening your presentation from 2014, I work as a member of the joint board of the South North Korea for compilations of the dictionary. All the important things have already been decided and ever since 2015, the joint meeting were not held so far. So even though I'm the member of the compilations of the dictionary, I don't have a full understanding. But Professor Yu gave us the background explanations and also you not only just gave us a background, but you told us how it is taking uh, progress one by one. And also, you mentioned uh, a certain thing was decided based on what kind of background. But what I'd like to raise is that without having that kind of thorough understanding, when they, when people uh, use Kyoremal Kinsajon, will they be able to accept it as it is? I mean, we need to prepare because there could be some confusions by the users. Of course, this is an integrated dictionary, and we don't know which one is the standard or which one is not. And also, when we try to explain, we need to understand uh, where th these certain words are used in North Korea, certain words are used in South Korea, and some of the examples must be used, and also in terms of the notation, you have to give a background because some of the, uh, of course, there was a consensus on notation, but some of the notations are not agreed or unfamiliar. Of course, we are trying to integrate the words. If we fully understand the significance of coming up with integrated dictionary, but still because two Koreas are divided and uh, we have used for six decades and trying to make it as one integrated Kyoremal Kinsajan, people need to understand the background. Background. So my question is, do you have any countermeasures or any ways to overcome this uh, people's curiosity or people's misunderstanding how this integrated dictionary came into being? Or if you don't have any countermeasures, now's the time that we need to gather our wisdom to come up with the countermeasures. The reason why I'm thinking about this is because last week there was a special report. There was a survey about the people's perceptions about unification and the people who believe that unification is a must. 
the percentage of the people who feel that way is decreasing as the year goes by. There are more people who believe that unification is not a mandatory or not a necessity. Going to the younger generations, when I look at the homepage of the Ministry of Unification, about on average 25 percent of the young generation people believe. Sorry, uh, overall the people believe 25 percent unification is not necessary. But among the 20s, they believe 35 percent, and especially young generation more than 35. To 41st percent believes that unification is not necessary. Of course, the elder generation, we believe unification is a must, but not anymore. They also look at the issue of the security, and some say that unification is necessary because we can take a further leap into the future in terms of the economic field. There are people who are taking more practical approach toward unification. That is the current situation. So. At this uh, juncture, we need to expand and further develop Korean American Saijon. As we publish this dictionary, we need to make sure that the dictionary is welcomed by the people throughout Korea. So what is your countermeasures? How are you going to handle this? That was my question. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we listen to uh, Ms. Chung Yuan's question and uh, her comments and uh, impressions about the presentation. And for that, Professor Yu, uh, if you may please reply. Well, when I say to use, I use the word that this is in the uh, progress or progressive or evolving. Let me tell you that this evolving dictionary is a concept that I came up with. In 2002, there was a sort of a sample of the dictionary of Kyoremarkin Sajan. I have analyzed it for several months. And I try to find out the special features. How can we explain the features of this dictionary? And the reason why I have come up with the concept of evolving dictionary is because it is an open dictionary. It can be constantly be updated and modified. The first reason is because the progress itself is critical. Not only the final uh, result is important, but the progress, how we came up with this dictionary is important. If you look at the North Korea's great dictionary of Korean language, it has its own history. And also, if you look at the Korean standard language dictionary, it reflects also the Korean traditions and culture, such as how the independence movement was unfolded, it consolidated the feeling of pride of the Korean nationals. So the dictionary itself is important, but also the process or the step-by-step -step approach that we have taken is meaningful. Kyoremai Kunsa John have continued to evolve in the past 16 years. and. In the beginning, we have used the word of unified dictionary, but now we have come up with the concept of the integrated dictionary. The reason is because we accepted the fact that this is an evolving dictionary when we have the meeting among the North and South Korea. We always make record of the meeting itself because all the process we need to keep the record, either the audio or the video record is uh, kept. Because once again, the process of coming up with this Kerema uh, Kinsajan, we believe all the recording will be remembered and recorded as an important step. And the process itself is very meaningful. And also, sustainability is important. And as I said, the evolving means that we need to constantly modify and rectify because some of the dictionaries are released in uh, on, op on uh, home on internet sorry internet which means that we should not just pursue a completed version because if we do that then for example when North Korea would like to join then we cannot so that is why we need to open this and instead of just concluding this type of the dictionary, we need to make sure that the integrating process is open. And any time North Korea would like to join, they can always join. So instead of final conclusions, we thought the Korean American Center should be sort of an incomplete format of the dictionary. Second, most of the users just look at the dictionary and come to assessment. But they, the users, must understand the process. And also there are some byproducts 
uh, so for example, like corpus or also the words, and also there are a, a lot of the uh, pictures that we have included, and also the lexicons, so the history, the process, and the recording, the audio and video, all of these that we have compiled in coming up with the completed versions of the Korean Kunsaja. And we believe that those records can be regarded as another content. So the reason why I said that this is evolving dictionary is because there are other things as well. And the final result of the Kyorema Kinsajon, we can come up with other derivatives, for example. The examples can be regarded as another uh, content, so, and the contents can also be published separately. So the dictionary itself that is supposed to be published this year is not a completed final version, but we have to understand the history, the background, everything. That's why I have used the word of the evolving dictionary. Jung Hee Won, Dr. Jung Hee Won, thank you very much for your discussion. Well, I guess your discussion is more interesting than my presentation itself. And thank you very much for pointing that out. And I was deeply impressed with your discussion. What kind of direction should we come up? What kind of plan do we need to have regarding the dictionary? I mean, this dictionary was published and compiled using taxpayers' money, and we need to persuade people, the users, and we need to give them a background. And that is why yesterday in today's International Academic Forum is extremely important. And I believe that today's and yesterday's academic forum can definitely be uh, a special chance to publicize the Kyorema Kinsajon. So the forum itself is another step. And yesterday and today, I have listened carefully to all the presentation. And I heard the presentations about the indigenous language and also the native languages. Because the languages that are on the, on the verge of extinct, we need to preserve them. And some of the words exist within the Kyorema Kinsajon. I was able to witness that some of the vocabularies. So UNESCO has its own goal to preserve indigenous language. And in that sense, dictionary is extremely important. And in that sense, Karema Kinsajan can be regarded as a great example. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yun. From the early stage of the compilation project, I was a member of the board. And Professor Yu has uh, went through the chronological development of the compilation project. And uh, as you listen to the discussion of uh, Director Chong, I think it enlightened more of the issues. Uh, the dictionary as a process is not the end itself. It is a new beginning, uh, which was proposed by Professor Yu. I think this holds great implications to all the members of the board of the Kyoremal Kunsajan. And thank you very much for the discussion. And uh, who will speak next? Yes, may I take the microphone? Yes, Professor Kimasu. I'd like to make a comment and discussion on Professor Hube's presentation. I'd like to add my opinion and also ask a couple of questions. First of all, let me share my personal opinion. When we talk of uh, the division issue, many people compare the similarities of Germany and Korea in that uh, German made a model case unification. We should also pursue a German type of unification. Many people hold such type of fantasies and hopes. However, I think we must make some things clear in that there are differences. So that is what I want to talk about as my opinion. In the case of Germany and uh, Korea, it seems German made a very model case of reunification. And even though it may seem that it is a model case, but that is something that is not easy to follow uh, because that was, Germany had its own unique situation. Uh, because German never fought an internal or interracial war. It was uh, the result of the defeat of the war, and this was what resulted in the division. So another strength was that there wasn't any internal hostility 
or hostile sentiments among the German people. On the other hand, uh, it may, we may have different definitions of the Korean War, but the beginning was a kind of a civil war, which was then uh, intervened by external forces. When you think of a civil war, it is a war between two civic groups. Through when the war begins as a uh, fight within, there is a long standing animosity and hostility and hatred. So, in overcoming this uh, anti sentiment and pursuing unification, it means we have to go through a more challenging uh, task and sentiment, and psychologically and physically, it means we have to bear a greater risk and burden. Uh, so, just by simply pursuing a German type of unification, I think that is kind of too simple minded. In the case of Germany, when the Cold War structure of the war ended, then the division made no, uh, there was no longer, there, wa there wasn't any long need, longer need, uh, uh, need to have the division in place. But in Korea, that was not a case. There was a long standing uh, hostile sentiment. And another is the time difference of normatization of the language. We understand that the German spelling so standardization and the Korean spelling standardization has a quite big time difference. In Europe, German was one of the late comers in standardizing their language in 1903 in a Freudian type. So when the German, when Germany was divided into East and West, it's already 40 years after the German language was standardized previously. However, in the case of Korea, it was only during the colonial rule in 1933 that a proposal, proposed bill for the standard Korean spelling was simply declared. And uh, actually, it wasn't used throughout the society. Of course, there were the civic-led illiteracy movement, but there wasn't any governmental official initiation. And once Korea was liberated from colonial rule in 1945, uh, then the Korea was divided in two. So from a historical perspective, uh, the standard Korean spelling has never been used throughout the entire country. So if South and North Korea wants to create a new momentum, we must make efforts, actually conscious efforts, to unify the standards because we lack a kind of a natural energy from within. When you think of the compilation of the Kyoremal Kunsajon, it holds a great significance in this regard because it will spark a new light within our minds to create new passion, new affection to try to standardize the uh, Korean language in the future. And this was the opinion that I wanted to add during my discussion, and now I'd like to move on to my questions to Professor Hubei. During your presentation, you talked about the dual usage of language for East Germans, the so-called language of the state and the party for official use, and a couple of years ago, I read a paper by a scholar called Auer. I also read a similar concept that was there was a tendency to use the so-called language of the state and the party. And in their private lives, their daily lives, the normal German language, like that of the West, was used. was in Korean means a dual language life. Officially, they would refer to terms like the state and the party, but in their homes and with their families, they would use normal German language, just like West Germans. And as you mentioned, this dual use of language was normalized after unification. It transformed to the normal German, West German expressions after unification. 
And what I am curious about is whether there, since such East German expressions could not have disappeared immediately, I am curious whether there was a kind of a stigmatization for East German expressions in that process. Uh, yesterday, Professor Boye mentioned about the kind of uh, concept of stigmatization for the Occitan uh, language. And if that is the case in East Germany, what was the solutions or efforts to overcome such issue? And next, I think it was already from the 1970s. We could see that the East German language would gain some of its unique characteristics, and according to scholar Kurt Junge, there is a feminine noun and a masculine noun, and for the feminine noun, the suffix in would be inserted, just like in letter in. The suffix in for the feminine noun would be omitted in sentences in East Germany. For example, for lighterin, it means it refers to a female manager. Instead of referring to lighterin, it would be said lighter in some cases, as I read in literatures. So in the same context, I'm curious whether it returned to the original grammar of using the feminine suffix and referring to as slightery. And if that was the case, uh, did the government make any uh, intentional or conscious efforts? Or were there any uh, specific policies or support? Or did it return to the normal grammar uh, in a natural way with time? So these are the two questions that I'd like to ask. Professor Hubei, are you ready to reply? Yes, thank you. For your additional comments and explanation, I am very grateful and I truly agree. Actually, even the conditions for the division of Germany and Korea were entirely different. So unification of German Germany cannot be applied to the Korean case, and that is what I entirely agree to. About your questions, I have slightly different perspectives. Uh, there are German scholars that may make such arguments. But in cases, well, sometimes it may be there could be a possibility of being oversensitive about a certain issue. So that was what came to my mind when I listened to your question. So let me share my view. For East Germans, we could say that they were somewhat forced to disguise themselves in their official lives and pretend to be someone else in the official lives, in their official lives. So they somewhat needed to lie to themselves in the long run. There was a sense of desperation about the fact that they had no choice but to lie. So in the long run, this led to East Germans seeking unification. From a general perspective, that was the impression that I received. That is, for East Germans, they could no longer stand the lying government and regime. We want to be free to express ourselves in a true manner, just like West Germany. And that was why they came out to the streets 
and asked for unification. And I think that was one way to allow them to overcome that dual usage of language in a gradual manner. So to my knowledge, there doesn't seem to be any specific policy or measure to overcome such uh, usage. And as you have also mentioned, East Germans also enjoyed making jokes about uh, famous politicians, just like everybody. And that was another way of overcoming their forced uh, dual language life. And about the stigmatization that you mentioned, I think it could also be viewed from a somewhat dis different perspective. For example, that type of stigma, I believe, did not come from the fact that they had to live a dual life. Rather, after unification, such a stigmatization occurred. And as a person that also spent a part of my life in West Germany, I think I am entitled to criticizing West German people to a certain degree. West Germany, when they go to East Germany, when they, they could witness the failed economy, and then they could be boastful of themselves, be, feel a sense of superiority. And this type of attitude and senti sentiment causes East Germans to feel a kind of a hostility toward West German people. And this was something that occurred after unification. Also, we could also think of another issue related to that. The so-called Saxon dialect in West Germany could create kind of a sense of uncomfortableness when you hear that dialect pronunciation. If an East German has a strong Saxon accent, then normally West German people would feel and express their sense of being uncomfortable about it. I talked about Ulbricht. Well, that person himself has a very strong accent. Whenever you hear the dialect, I, there was also the sense of uh, uncomfortableness, and maybe that could have caused a so-called stigmatization, and the East Germans themselves were aware of that. So they themselves corrected their own accents. They tried to overcome their accents, to follow the standard articulation. I think that was how we could understand that process. And lastly, about your last comment, I do not think that is an issue limited to East Germany. I think it is also something concerning West Germany. And I think it is also an issue of our generation. For example, if we make a comparison with Korea, during, well, we call, we refer to President Park Geun-hye, but a certain social movement, may, if it asks us to change the title to a female president instead of a president, then who would welcome that? Well, let me give you another example. From a general point of view, 
There is a, a conditions for a successful operation of a school. It requires the teachers and the students to have a smooth communication. And in Germany, if that is your logic, then there will be teachers and female teachers, students and female students that should have a smooth communication for the school to run properly. Then that is the logic. If that is the logic, I think that would feel unnatural on the part of Koreans as well. The, for the masculine noun, in many cases imply both the feminine definition. So in many cases there isn't much need to distinguish between the feminine form and the masculine form. Of course, even in Germany, there are, there actually is a strong argument that the two forms of nouns should continue to be distinguished. Well, now I am of the older generation, so myself, I'm not that fully supportive of that movement. The movement. That wants to kind of artificially change or modify the language. So, when you think of the current status of uh, the German language regarding the difference of dialects and classes or generations, uh, you mean that it is a reflection, the current German language is a reflection of the natural uh, change and transmission. Uh, just as people look down on these accent dialect, but that was the same for the West German dialect in the past. So you mean that that was overcome through, uh, through gradual convergence, yes. Thank you very much for your comments and replies. Uh, as I listened to Professor Hubert's presentation about West Germany and East Germany, and uh, you also showed us the two national flags, and uh, you showed its similarities. And uh, you also compared that with the two flags of South and North Korea. As a matter of fact, up to 1948, the two Koreas shared the same national flag, but it became two different flags in 1948. Just as Professor Kimasu mentioned, it, in the case of Germany and in the case of Korea, we had two different paths of division. And I think that was the background of why the national flags are so different as well. So the presentation was very interesting. The Academic International Forum is being broadcast live through the YouTube streaming. And there are questions to Professor Hube. So let me share one of the questions and then ask for your reply before moving on. Well, before that, I'd like to ask Professor Gyanyong Su to read the question. Well, before that, uh, since I like before that, I want to first uh, tell you that so many are impressed with your fluent English, fluent Korean. Well, there are many questions, but since I myself have a uh, need to re make a comment myself, I'll read one question. When you look at the division, when you uh, you stress the different conditions of division of the uh, language division and the language situation of Korea and Germany. So what kind of uh, solutions could you suggest for us to overcome the language differences in the case of Korea? Should I give an answer? Well, since I am not a Korean person, I do not know whether I am entitled to give an answer. So if I refer to the spirit of great King Sejong, if I may, if I dare may, I'd like to make a proposal. And 
I'd also like to share my admiration for the noble spirit of King Sejong when he invented the hunger character. And if we follow that spirit, I believe that we can succeed. So to add, the hunger alphabet it may sound somewhat intriguing if I say this, but I believe that the Hangul alphabet is an alphabet of peace. When you look at the history of Hangul, politically and socially, in the peaceful unification of South and North Korea, it is being used as the most precious means, even though the two languages are divided. But the means of unifying the two will be hunger itself. So we should, uh, we should value that spirit of the hunger. And if we seek an answer to unification, I believe we will succeed. You refer to the power of hunger. That was a very impressive comment. And next, I'd like to ask Professor Junamo for your present, for your discussion. And uh, I will be commenting on Ms. Pyongyang's presentation. You presented on how you collected the dialects in Kazakhstan for the Karamal Kunsajan compilation. Ms. Pyon, I understand that the Karamal Kunsajan had uh, long been in charge of collecting local languages, which was also introduced during your presentation. As a matter of fact, in Kazakhstan and these regions, uh, it is a very challenging task. And so and you shared the outcomes of that project. I believe that there could be many methodologies of conducting the researches. So uh, if I may, I'd like to propose that uh, a more detailed explanation of the methodology would be helpful for uh, the readers and audience to understand the study. So I'd also like to share a couple of questions that came to my mind as I read through your paper about the methodology of collection. That was my first question. And secondly, when you look at the collection, especially when you go outside of the Korean Peninsula, many of the Koreans were uh, were migrated. So in some cases, uh, the original forms uh, remained without change because of uh, the fact that the region was isolated, unlike Korea alone. And uh, since it's uh, located in China and Russia, uh, there could be many words uh, that were newly created uh, with contact with the nearby countries. And the migrants themselves, since they were isolated and dispersed, uh, it could also create new variants of uh, the Korean language. So when you look at the collection of the material, we can see uh, many variants even within that collection. As I read through your presentation, you talked about Murgupche, and I looked it up. Uh, there's another uh, listing called Marukopche. Markov, I don't know the Russian meaning, but uh, it is. Uh, but I found out that it means carrot in Russian. And there could be different pronunciations depending on the regions. So we can see these different variants, and I understand that it would have been very difficult to uh, have them categorized. So I was curious how you classified them, and uh, so it would have been better if the process was more elaborated. And with that, I'd like to end my comment. Well, I do understand that the presentation was very brief and couldn't cover the details. Uh, so thank you for your insightful advice and comment. Uh, I focused on the collection of the Korean language during my presentation. And, and I tried to focus more on the classification, especially during the presentation. So 
I think that is why you said that it would be better to elaborate on the methodology. Just as you wrote in your discussion, uh, regarding the method of collecting new words, you could do a field study, you could use literature, or you could refer to existing documents. And uh, you said that it would be better to elaborate on the methodology. Well, we did actually use the three methods, all the three methods. In terms of the uh, document research, we refer, we had an out, we had it outsourced, and uh, we also did field studies. And uh, also within our board, we did conduct studies of the existing material for the actual field study in Korea. There was Gyeongsangdo, Jeollado, Gangwondo, Jeju-do provinces uh, as uh, six cities. So we conducted. Uh, we collected the actual storytelling and articulations of the respondents and for literature studies, uh, South and North Korea, Ryeonbyon and Russia were the locations uh, where we collected the newspapers and uh, other publications to collect the corpus and to utilize existing literature. It's actually not new vocabs because they are already enlisted. So we can now refer to them as new vocabs. But as I said in my presentation, uh, there's the standard Korean language dictionary of South Korea and the great dictionary of Korean language in North Korea. And these were our two main referrals. For the enlisted headwords in the two dictionaries were endowed the status of a new word in our study. That was our principle. For the local dictionary, there are so many dialects. Uh, for example, the Jeju dic dialect dictionary was an example. And uh, we also referred to a literature uh, dictionary and also the Kim Song edition, edition of uh, uh, the Korean dictionary was another referral. And for the different uh, vocabulary forms, uh, you also asked about the criteria of make a selection, whether it's Murkopche or Gongnisa. Uh, there would be diverse forms, but for us, when we look at our when we look at our uh, study, that was how we made. We had our own criteria. It's actually difficult for us to determine whether this is an authentic language or not because. We have to go through the historical development, which is not easy to uh, actually analyze. So which is the basic form, which is the authentic form, uh, this making a decision on that was not that easy. But if we want to determine a new form, then we, had, we used the existing dictionaries as a basis to make a criteria. For example, for such uh, phonetic uh, variations like uh, the vowel, round, vowel rounding or front voweling, well, in a case, in a sense, uh, we may not say that is a variation itself, but compared to comparing that, comparing the new vocabs with the existing vocabularies, uh, we try to distinguish between the two by imposing these types of variations. Uh, well, I'm not replying to all of your comments in your discussion paper, but let me promise that I will reflect all of your comments and advice in the update of my presentation. And in a case, we may not know for sure whether the Kazao vocabulary are the variants of the existing language or not. So we do not know which process, uh, which direction the process took place. But so I like to uh, try to understand. I like to try to explain uh, this type of uh, limitation. Thank you very much for your discussion. We have participants from home and abroad and we are receiving lots of messages, comments, and questions through our YouTube channel. But I'd like to apologize that we cannot share them with you because of time limitations. During the panel discussion, we discuss about 결의 말 
Kinsajan, and also we discuss about the sustainable development of the compilations. Well, Kyoremba Kinsajan is now regarded from the global perspective. It has its own significance and its own role to play. So the time that we had during the panel discussion was very meaningful. Once again, thank you very much, all the presenters and panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes the panel discussion. On behalf of the organizer, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude to the presenters. Yes, please be seated, please. We have participants on site, but also we have people virtually joining us. And from the very beginning until now, quite a bit of people are uh, virtually joining us. Once again, my deep expressions, appreciation goes to participants. Now, we'll continue a special discussion on the subject of building strategic links for international decades of indigenous language. First of all, I'd like to invite Deputy Permanent Delegate Yaha Almata Zube of UNESCO, who will chair the special discussion. As you can see on the screen, Zube is joined virtually from Gambia. Um, I wish to first um, express my sense of gratitude to the organizers, the Joint Board of um, South and North Korea, um, the Korean National Commission for UNESCO, and the Korean Permanent Delegation for UNESCO for the invitation as a speaker and moderator at this important event in my capacity as representative of the electoral group of African member states at UNESCO to the steering committee for the organization of the 2019 International Year of Indigenous Language, and also to the steering committee for the organization of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. Distinguished speakers, some participants and listeners, um, for centuries, language has served as a historic medium of integration and communication almost amongst humans. In the current global setting, where new realms are unfolding every day, it should be noted that language has made great contribution to these advancements. There are many indigenous languages around the world which were never documented or brought forward to the attention of the world. Regarding the question on the work of the steering committee at UNESCO for the International Decade of Indigenous Languages 2020-2032, I am pleased to report that it had developed a well-structured transitional system from the outgoing um, 20 Indigenous Year of 2019 to the International Decade of Indigenous Languages by building strategic linkages for the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, thus creating um, a continuity for a transitional system by adopting a success, um, the success stories, good practices, and lessons learned from the organization and successful implementation of the strategic plan of the 2019 um, International Year of Indigenous Languages. The key conclusions of the year um, were, was that there is a need to maintain the momentum through the continued engagement of member states, indigenous peoples, academia, public and private sector, actors and other stakeholders. The methodology for the resource mobilization strategy included a revised a review of major documents, need assessment, SWOT analysis, a SWOT analysis, consultations, analysis of existing funding structures and schemes, including the fund established for the decade of indigenous people and the mapping of other potential donors. Now coming to the issue of the mechanism of, of, of the international decade and uh, indigenous languages and some of the um, practical plans, um, the committee um, had been working on quite a lot of activities 
and this includes but are not limited to the following six um, activities. Um, one of them was the establishment of a global task force for making a decade of action for languages 2020-2021 um, and the in the and the in, and, and, and yeah and the um, international decade of indigenous languages 2022-2032 excuse me for that so a global task force entitled making a decade of action for indigenous languages was established and an international governance mechanism to organize the international decade as well it composed of four activities or four entities which was the steering committee um, the, an advisory group um, to the steering committee and an ad hoc, ad hoc group to provide professional expertise as well as a multi-stakeholder consultation um, meetings as well as series of um, stakeholder um, consultative meetings the structure of the global task force was developed based on recommendations provided by members and observers of the steering committee for the organization of the 2019 International Year of Indigenous Languages. It was also based on the outcome document, the last Pinus declaration, making a decade of action for indigenous languages at the high level closing event of the International Year organized on the 20th, 27th and 28th February 2020 in Mexico City. And here, another point that was uh, uh, um, what I'm um, noting was um, the committee um, were able to develop a revised roadmap towards the global action plan in view of the ongoing COVID-19 to allow more time for consultations. Um, a third point that was um, very important was a feasibility study for the establishment of a multi-donor funding mechanism for the indigenous, international indigenous a decade of indigenous languages was also conducted and their findings will serve as input um, to the preparation of the international decade. The um, a fourth one, which is um, just to be um, uh, brief, a fourth one would be an online survey of the, was an online survey of the global action plan. It was conducted and the target groups included members of the ad hoc committee group stakeholders involved in the international year, um, national governments, civil society, academia, other public and private um, stakeholders and the uh, UN. This was done to ensure that the work initiated in the framework um, of the 2019 international year of indigenous languages would continue. And, and the fifth point was um, a revised um, 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 vision statement was developed by the ad hoc group which envisioned a world where indigenous people using indigenous languages work together with all to create better futures for peace, sustainable development, justice, recognition, and reconciliation in our societies. And a world where indigenous people and indigenous languages contribute to peace building, sustainable development, justice, recognition, and reconciliation in our societies for creation of better features for all. Last but not the least was a, 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 a strategic outcome document was developed and series of recommendations were made that met, um, like uh, measures to protect and promote linguistic diversities and multilingualism, which should be focused on sustainable, which should focus on sustainable development, leaving no one behind which is an integral part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Same, in the same, on, um, on this, at the same level, um, the protocol actions, we recommended that the, proto, um, and the proposed actions should also take into consideration the connection between linguistic diversity and multilingualism on the one hand, and the biodiversity and the natural ecological environment on the other. This will have an increasingly benefic um, a beneficial impact on indigenous language uses and the ways and their ways of life, as well as uh, both rural and um, in the urban population. Um, we also 
I'm, I'm, I'm putting part into consideration that the protection and promotion of linguistic diversity and multilingualism, <laughs> noting that it helps to reinforce economic um, development. Mm -hmm. um, there was also the issue of um, um, plants. We, we indicated that plants should encompass the full range of human rights and the fundamental freedom while promoting linguistic <coughs> diversity and multilingualism. Um, another important issue that was um, um, considered here was um, uh, building up a strategic linkages. If we, if we talk about the, the, the building of strategic link, linkages, I would, um, I would want to just um, highlight a few things, um, in, within, especially within the education system, because no matter how much we, we, we work on and whatever we do, unless we, 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 we build uh, linkages, between everything that is being said here and our education systems, we, have, we are not going anywhere. There are enormous, enormous potentials of linguistic skills for economic development and social integration. Some of these include preserving indigenous languages and helping children to learn their indigenous languages, which helps them to develop a sense of belonging through cultural identity. Another one is creating an enabling environment for childcare for indigenous communities, which entails supporting parents with relevant training and skills development for gainful employment. Parents advance their education and obtain employment. They can support their children through their education cycle rather than withdraw them for fear of losing their identity, which is their indigenous um, 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 uh, ethnicity or whatever you might call it. Another one I, I, I thought was really very important is, is really important is a strategic linkage with governments. We must begin with the revitalization of indigenous curriculum in community schools. Allow children to speak their indigenous languages, both at home and in school, especially at early grade, while learning other languages as they progress. And I'm pleased to say that um, in the Gambia, uh, uh, the Gambia has started this process as well. Um, getting the children to learn their indigenous languages or the local languages as we call them um, up to um, grade three and then they, they combine it with the English language. And a fourth point was provide support and promote the recruitment of indigenous people as teachers to teach their languages as role models. Get the indigenous people who, 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 who are educated to as well um, teach the indigenous languages. Create partnership with institutions and private sector as part of corporate social responsibility, because we all have our corporate social responsibilities, so that we can sponsor indigenous children through their education. And last but not the least is um, UNESCO and the UN agencies may consider a, requ a, a requirement for governments to preserve indigenous languages and, you know, um, and embed these languages in the curriculum and provide giant financing to promote these um, 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 programs. Um, I think UNESCO is working on this, but we still need to focus more on that. Um, and, um, ladies and gentlemen, since I know time is um, against us, and I would have to be opening a discussion um, on, um, on how we can build stronger linkages. I, I think I would, I, would, I would end my presentation here and then possibly jump into the um, a discussion on how we can build um, stronger, stronger linkages. If I need an introduction to that, um, please, Mr. Madam uh, Moderator, let me know. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, getting to the next uh, part, um, let's now come to the issue of um, uh, our special discussions um, on how we think we can build, I started something, stronger linkages between the International Decade of Indigenous Languages and World Networks, or at least um, language users and researchers in Korea, um, since that is the main theme that we are working on. And like I said um, earlier, um, many more indigenous languages exist which have never been acknowledged or recognized around the world. No one can deny the importance of these languages 
as these are close to the indigenous people, but can be, uh, or can, but can be surely claim that there is no, or there are some proper mechanisms for preservation of the said languages around the world. Uh, I would want to know. Um, today's initiative is a real step in the right direction. However, um, we all should think about mm -hmm. means build strategic linkages for the promotion of languages. And to build strategic linkages, therefore, we need to identify, maybe giving a little direction, and bring together a diverse range of stakeholders, including but are not limited to representative of national governments, leaders, experts, and researchers, indigenous people and their organizations, social media, and then analyzing the existing challenges, as well as identifying practical solutions and opportunities provided within the framework of the international decade. I think the organizers would need to um, 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 see that and eventually um, reflecting on the necessity of building a network among the Republic of Korea and the, Democrat, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the international community in order to contribute to the global action plan for the international decade. This would be very relevant. Um, I think um, I, I, I would invite um, um, people um, um, to this discussion, let us throw our ideas and see proposals that uh, most of you may have got that would help um, the partnership um, of uh, the Koreans. Thank you. Yes, Professor Hube, uh, may you make your comment? May I speak in Korean? Yes, uh, please feel free to speak in Korean. What I am curious. I'm hearing both the interpreters and the speakers. So I, I, I wonder what is happening. I, I don't think it's on my side. Yes. A deputy del the permanent delegate uh, is having some technical issues, so I'd like to ask our technicians to uh, resolve the issue. And uh, if Professor Hube makes your comment, I'll then uh, communicate, deliver that to Mr. Yata Almatar Dube later on. What I'm curious about is do the are there, do the indigenous uh, languages have their own transcription system or spelling system? Professor Hube asked a question. For the Gambian indigenous languages, does it have a transcription system to record that? Is this being delivered through translation? The question is whether the Gambia indigenous language has its own transcription or spelling system. Yes, it is being translated. I think we are having some technical issues for communication. So maybe our technicians could deliver the question in the chat box. Yes, the question was delivered through our chat box, so let us wait for a while. I, I, I think we're having a technical problem here because I'm, I'm hearing the, 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 the Korean um, language at a higher volume than even the English language at the same time. So maybe the technicians can help us here so that I can only hear the English translation, if possible.
Well, I'd like to apologize for the brief technical issue. Can I ask Professor Hubei to repeat your question, please? So may I begin? Yes, you may begin. Well, my question is, for the indigenous languages in Gambia, do they have their own transcription system for it to be written? Does it have a spelling system of its own? If not, does it use another type of uh, writing system? So i like to ask for your answer to this question. Thank you. Uh, OK, thank you. Um, thank, thank you, thank you um, very much. Um, here we have some small um, difference in terminologies. Because if it is in the Gambia, we don't call them indigenous languages. We call them la local languages. And local here means the indigenous, the people that are living, or the languages that are spoken by Gambians, which is totally different from English, French, German, and Spanish. Um, different from the conventional languages that have been used in school, we call them the mother tongue languages, meaning uh, local languages or indigenous, but we don't give them the connotation of indigenous. We call them mother tongue languages. And then we would use, we, we, we using, we started using some of those mother tongue languages because we have a lot of them, but we identified about a, 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 a Mandinka, Wolof, one called Mandinka, one called Wolof, and Ulfulde. And then those are the ones that are being um, taught in some pilot. But again, it's, it's written with our own alphabet, the English alphabet. So we don't have, we don't call them indigenous languages, we, we call them mother tongue languages. But again, they can all become the same as, uh, called the same as uh, indigenous languages in using this terminology that is mostly known. And the, 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 the Academy of, 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 um, of Languages in Africa, Akalan, is also at the African Union, is also developing um, all this um, uh, literature and so on, so that the African um, uh, member states can as well use their mother tongue languages or indigenous languages, as you would call them. Like, for example, the, the one that has finally been approved is the Swahili language, which is coming from Africa. So I, I, I don't know if that would answer your question, but we don't call them, in most African countries, we don't call them the indigenous languages. We call them the mother tongue languages or the local languages, which are different from the conventional um, languages. I hope that is of some help. Yes, in Gambia, you talked about the concept of mother tongue, mother, la mother language, and that in the case, uh, you used a single common transcription system. And uh, Hong, Mr. Hong Yunzhen also raised your hand. Yeah. <clears throat> mother tongue or local language, although they are the mother language or local language, whatever, well, there could be languages without transcription system, right? The language must have transcription system so that it can exist. That's the normal perception, right? Among African languages, there could be languages or mother tongue without transcription system. Do they make any effort to come up with a transcription system? Is there any work going on? Are there a lot or any kind? Can you give an example or how it is going on? So this was a question about what kind of process you are taking in order to develop the transcription system for the mother tongue or local language. Were you able to hear the question? Sir?
because I, I hear both the speaker and the translator at the same time are having the problem. But again, um, it, it, it looks like the speaker was trying to ask whether we have our own trans, transcribed um, uh, wordings or whatever you might call it. Um, anyway, we're using the English the alphabet. We're using the English alphabet um, to, to, to write um, uh, the words in our mother tongue. Though, though, though we have a few transcription issues in it as well. I, I don't know if I if you get more um, clear. 네, 변천 위원장님 답변이 되셨을까요? Director Hong, was it sufficient? So you said that you use English alphabet, right? But it could be quite difficult to write everything down, right? The question was that some mother tongue languages in Africa uh, do not have characters, as, as you said. So do you have any like uh, efforts or tries to make characters with some letters? That, that was the question. Yes, yes, um, absolutely. Because we, we might use the English alphabet, but we have some accents on them and some, some sort of, um, uh, how you call it again, markings and uh, to show how high a note could be or how low a note could be and so on. That is being adapted. Anyway, it's, 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 it's really well inscribed in, in Senegal and um, especially in the, in, the, in the local languages. And we are more or less using um, a similar approach. But since I'm not the expert that has been getting into that, I, I may not be the right person to give the, 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 the right answer to that. Uh, because um, currently, I, that's uh, knowledge I know, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the Gandhi. I'm speaking on, on, on behalf um, of the um, Africa group at UNESCO, which covers all the um, African member states. But obviously, there are some. And uh, maybe to link you up with the African Academy of Languages, which is Akalan, um, at the African Union, they would be in a better position and the director would be in a better position to share that uh, with uh, the Korean um, team. But um, I, I, I may not be the right person to just um, dwell into that aspect because I'm a member of the steering committees for the indigenous languages, um, e international year So uh, my perspective is more or less on the activities that um, UNESCO, us as members of the steering committee, have been working on to improve indigenous languages. Yes, uh, there was uh, the common language and the native mother tongue, and uh, you gave some elaborative explanations about its transcription, and you also promised us to give some additional uh, replies later on. So we may move on to a new topic. And uh, Vice President, do you have any comments or questions to make? Um, uh, hello. Yeah, so we have some technical issues. So when someone speaks something, I will I will um, talk to you through the chatting, so you can see the chatting, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, as uh, you said that you're speaking as a member of the steering committee of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages and not as a, a national of Gambia. Of Gambia. Therefore, at UNESCO, uh, you're working on the World uh, Atlas of Languages, and I understand there are many indigenous language-related projects. And as I recall yesterday's discussions, uh, I understand that uh, there was a broad collection of indigenous languages of many regions throughout the world. 
about the literature, storytelling, or myths, or legends, or folklore would exist of all the indigenous languages. And so do, does UNESCO already have a collection of the corpus of such? For example, for Gambia, it would have its own literature and literary texts. Are they already collected as a corpus? in the case of Gambia. So this is my first question I'd like to ask to you. Uh, uh, th th thank you very much for, for that question. Um, I, I think I reflected on, I, I just want, I just don't want to be misconstrued here. I reflected on the Gambia to give an example of what is happening in the Gambia. Uh, but um, actually, I, I, I am not the authority that would be able to say, um, to, 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 to explain um, in, in totality the issue of the mother tongue in the Gambia. Uh, what I wanted to say is, I'm trying to build up linkages is we have to learn from what other countries are doing. Uh, though somebody mentioned the issue of what would be advice Korea. Um, when we look at the strategic document and so on, um, Korea, the permanent delegation of Korea um, um, is also part of the, the, the steering committee. It's in the steering committee. And I assume that all the developments that are taking place at UNESCO um, uh, with the steering committee, the work of the steering committee is something that is well known by the, 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 the permanent delegation and, and, and I think um, the, the National Commission, the, 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 the Aryan sector, uh, the, the Korean sector within the community. The, the international... Sorry, okay. So, so, so that being the case, I, I, I can only be authority on the development that we are doing and the linkages that we are doing between um, UNESCO and all member states. And all the developments that are taking place between UNESCO and member states are being tra translated into all these languages, um, conventional languages we're talking about, not the indigenous, and submitted to the member states. So maybe the, the, the permanent delegate of the Korean delegation um, could be able to dwell on that aspect of the link as well, because we know it is sent to member states. But uh, with regards to the issue of uh, the Gambia and the mother tongue and local languages, I think I said it outright that I am not the right authority. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Gambia. I am Gambia's representative in UNESCO, and I am indicating the issues that are taking place. And I'm trying to use an example that I know that is taking place in the Gambia about the transcription of mother tongue language and when it was being transcribed it is now being um, um, introduced into the schools and we have teachers that are teaching it and there is a syllabus for it but i i am afraid i may not be able to look, get into detail when it comes to the issue of mother tongue languages but i don't mind um submitting to to to, to the organizers um, a name and a contact of um, the, the, the Secretary General or President of the, the, the Akalan, which is the African Languages, Institute of Af African Languages, so that those people are the experts and they will be the right people that will be able to give the exact answer into it. Um, most of the distortions that I, I said I was trying to get into, I, I wanted us to having listened to what we have said about what the steering committee is doing and the involvement, I was expecting that um, um, the Korean delegation would look at all those issues, all, all those pointers, and see how we can integrate, they can integrate with UNESCO on that, or how they can integrate with other countries on that issue. I don't know if I'm very clear. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Jung Hee Won. Well, there is a permanent delegation of ROK to UNESCO, and also 
he is saying that UNESCO is taking part as the member of the steering committee, right? Then maybe you should have told we should have told to the National Institute of Korean Language, and then is the Kyore American Saizon is being collaborated together with UNESCO. Well, this is a thing that I don't have much knowledge. Within Korean government ministries, there are so many different departments, and UNESCO is actually under the umbrella of Ministry of Education. And in case of the National Institute of Korean Language, we are under the umbrella of Ministry of Culture Sports. Of course, language is something that we need to collaborate. And if you look at the language policy in Korea, that falls under the delegations of the Ministry of Culture. And we have dispatched our member working in the permanent delegation of ROK to UNESCO. Well, but I learned about it. I will make sure that we work closely with the Ministry of Education. Well, since we have with us Deputy Permanent Yaha with us, I'd like to share the case of Korea. Korea is a country not comprised of different ethnic groups. So for us, we don't have the concept of the indigenous language or different things because mother tongue is same as uh, the Korean language, which is same as so-called indigenous language. Because if you look at the Korean history, we don't have uh, much different ethnic groups. Of course, there are some dialects, but even though the dialects we do have, we can still communicate. The only difference is the language spoken or used in Jeju Island is a little bit different than the standard Korean language. But UNESCO has designated language used in Jeju Island as a language that is on the verge of being uh, extinct or it's an endangered language. So Jeju language, the young generation, they don't understand. So there's some difficulties in communicating between the older and young generation. Of course, Jeju Island has published a separate books and has a Jeju language class during their curriculum. One interesting thing is that Jeju Island is a place, the best destination for Korean tourists. If you look at the menu or the outdoor um, things, then a lot of things are written in Jeju Island. That's why people would like to learn Jeju language. And for targeting the Jeju older generations, the uh, National Institute of Korean Language conducted an investigation to know more about uh, special uh, words or dialects used in Jeju Island. We've done some investigation, and we found out that there are things that we cannot actually write using the Korean transcription system. We found out that we need a new systems to write down all those uh, dialects. So once again, we realized that we definitely need a special notation mechanism or a special ways to write down all those dialects. And we are in the process of writing down those notations. Thank you very much, Director Chung. You refer to the Jeju dialect and uh, what kind of national effort is being made to preserve the Jeju dialect. Did we lose our connection? And uh, Deputy Delegate Jobe is moderating the special session on building strategic linkages for the International Decade of Indigenous Languages 2022 to 2032. Let's wait for the link to be reconnected. Um, you you can unmute yourself. Yes. Sorry, I sorry I didn't mute myself. The internet was rebooting, and then everything went off, and just came back. Uh, what 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 what, I, what I'm saying what I'm saying here is um, uh, if you talk about if you compare. Um, the Gambia and what is happening in Korea, I, 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 w I wonder if, if it would match well. Because like, for example, in the Gambia, we, we, we have almost over, you have almost over 12 or 13, you know, um, mother tongue languages, which are being spoken. So all what we have done there is to identify the three topmost 
languages and then it is those languages that we have started um, um, introducing into the schools so 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 that is all what i can say because um, from yesterday when um, somebody one of the presenters said in korea uh, you don't have that much problem uh, because almost most of the people speak the language the same language more or less the same language but the only difference that you have in korea if i'm right is that some have learned it in school and can read and write it others did not learn it at school this is totally different in in the gambia in the gambia what was happening is everybody was learning english and then we have almost about 12 or more um, mother tongue languages and then government decided to take three out of those mother tongue languages develop the literature it is developed there is a developed literature for it and it is part of the syllabus and it is being taught just like you teach english language in conventional schools up from grade one to grade three and if they get to grade three then english is being introduced as a subject by then they would have learned to read and write their local languages and then in grade three they would jump into um, english language and combine the two of them it's 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 a it's it's at a starting stage to improve the situation anyway but um this is all i can say about the gambia like i said um i wasn't prepared to speak about gambia here i was prepared to talk about um, as a member of the representative of the africa group in this um, steering committee of international languages and then to talk about the achievements that we have done at the unesco level um, migrating from the international year of indigenous languages to the international decade of indigenous languages and then to share the success stories and the development that unesco has done to make sure to migrate from in the, the year to the decade so um, i guess it will be our last question um, you know, you, yesterday you were here and you heard about Jeoremal Kinsajan, which is Grand Korean Dictionary here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What do you think would be, uh, what, as, as Korea or government of Korea or Jeoremal Kinsajan, what do you think we could do in order to contribute to IDIL or World Atlas? Well, yes, um, uh, my, my advice here would be. Um, Have, uh, 네, 제 의견을 말씀드리겠습니다. 먼저 저희가 저희가 I think somebody spoke yesterday who, who was responsible. Um, Chief wrote yes, uh, spoke yesterday to indicate that uh, from UNESCO that we are developing an atlas of indigenous languages. So all what we need to do is through the permanent delegation, um, Korea can um, share their transcripts and everything and follow it up with the chief at the UNESCO so that they can give them I'm, I'm sure they must have done it already, um, so, so that it can also be included in the Atlas of Indigenous Languages. I, I think that's, that's, those are some of the things that we need to do. That would, that's what I would advise, to lace with the permanent delegation um, who, who, are, who also have members, I think, um, uh, members of the steering committee, to, to give you the proper guidance so that at least you can register your local language, if it is not indigenous language, um, with, the, with the UNESCO Atlas. If it's not already done, I mean. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, so I'd like to propose to wrap up the discussion and conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, this discussion was on the strategic linkages for the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, and we heard from Mr. Jobe on what we could do. And I believe this topic is so broad and grand that it cannot be confined to this discussion session. And in the process of preparing for the academic forum of uh, the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, I believe we will have many more agendas being developed in the process, and we look forward to it. And with that, we would like to wrap up this discussion. And for the Kyore Mal Kunsajan, uh, we will consider uh, the bodies to work together so that we could work with the steering committee of the International Decade of Indigenous Language of UNESCO. Okay. Hello. Hello. What, um, uh, what, what, what I would have to say is if, 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 if I'm to, 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 to wrap up here is to say that the idea of, uh, of, of this um, <clears throat> um, joint um, activity between the Koreas, it's, it's a way in the, it's a step in the right direction because it means you will be consulting and, 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 and relating to each other and trying to unify um, your language, if the transcription is different, you would at least be able to unify the, 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 the transcription. And then um, learn from the good practices that other member states um, have achieved, as well as um, the indications and the issues that have been discussed here since yesterday, and uh, proposals that have been submitted by all the experts. I, I think um, in, in, in so doing, looking at all the good practices that um, people have shared with um, Korea during this forum and um, putting it into practice and trying to see which one you can adopt and adapt as well as um, adding on to what you've already got. I think that's the way forward. And uh, with the permanent delegation being at uh, UNESCO, they, I'm sure they have been doing a very good job and they, as well as the National Commission. Um, all those involved within Korea pertaining to this language should as well try to possibly channel their communication and correspondence through their permanent delegation so that they would represent them at UNESCO and submit some of most of your suggestions and proposals to UNESCO so that you can as well benefit from it thoroughly. Thank you very much to the moderator, Deputy Permanent Delegate Yaha, and other people as well. Well, when you look at languages, there are a lot of differences among the minority language, local language, indigenous language, and we were able to understand how we can build strategic link and what kind of direction we need to go. Ladies and gentlemen, now is the time to conclude International Academic Forum. Last but not least, we'd like to invite Vice President Chong Do Sang of Karimai Kinsajon to hear the closing remark. I'll hand over the microphone, and that's the end of me. Thank you very much. And my name is Ahn Hyejin. I'm the researcher working at Compilation Department of Karimai Kinsajon. Hello, everybody. We had a very long today's session. It was a long process. There were many presenters who delivered their presentations on various topics. We also had discussions. And also, uh, Director Hong jong san as the chair of the organizing committee, uh, made great contributions. I understand there are many difficulties, but you did your very best to make this forum successful. And I'd also like to extend gratitude to all the presenters and discussants of the International Academic Forum. Please uh, ask for your understanding, for not being able to uh, cite all your individual names due to time considerations. I also pay tribute to all the staff members of the joint board. In the second part of this year, we will hold another uh, International Academic Forum, and uh, we are committed to making full preparations with our wisdom and insight. Thank you very much.
감옥살이 지켰어. 